Hello, everybody, tuning into the Scrap Time Podcast. I'm here with Ben J. Nassim and special guest MC, a.k.a. Selium. Uh, I know it's been a little bit since we've ran one of these episodes. I think right before Champs was the last one. But, uh, you know, the off season has been getting pretty crazy. But uh, we're back in action, and we're going to start doing these a lot more consistently through the off season. try to get, like, once a week or something. But I appreciate you guys, obviously, joining so far. Ben, MC, how we doing? Uh, MC, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. I'm doing good, man. I've been just chilling, grinding my stream, you know, the off season. So I've been just doing that the whole, the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I've been streaming, a little bit of golfing. Got a lot of people in town this weekend, so been hanging out at night. Weather's been, bro, this week has been the weirdest week. Obviously, you're in California, Chris. Mm -hmm. But, bro, it's been, like, smoky because of all the yeah, I heard. Canadian wildfires. Like, I can sometimes smell it in my apartment. And, like, you go outside and you're just like, bro, I'm not going outside today. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Dude, I, I heard bro. that. I heard it's getting like that again. I didn't I didn't know that happened for the second time, but that's nuts, dude. Bro, it was, like, earlier this week it was bad. It mm -hmm. got better now because I think rain, the rain's kind of come through. But, like, yeah. But, like, beginning of this week, I was like, I'm not going outside. I'll see you later. I'm just sitting inside and just doing me. But well, that's what I've been up to. You know, we've been we've been waiting for the off season. It's been it's been a little slow roster mania, at least for us, you know, outside of the team stuff. People people are jonesing for the info, but I think things may pick up soon. Yeah, well, they should pick up relatively soon, right? Isn't there a date that like this, things can actually start going down, or is that Monday is Monday? when people could sign? That's what I mean. So, I feel so. I feel yeah. like a lot of things are slowing up just because of that too. It's like. You know, yeah, you can have all yeah. the info you want, but you don't know anything until like it's actually signed and stuff. So, I do feel like that's a big part of it. And also, just a disclaimer: MC is on hour seventeen or eighteen of a twenty-four hour stream right now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like grinding, bro. Oh my god, so he MC was right playing, now. bro. I I went back in, bro. You last time you guys were playing this game, like Pico game, and I've seen some clips, and bro, you guys were. Nick faded last night. Oh, that was, that was a bad squad. It was actually hilarious though, but it was like a criminal trio. We had Adam Z and Soap just fumbling. Oh my everything. god, dude! Oh yeah, my a god! Squad right yeah, there. that is the fumble fucking trio. Of, of, yeah, and of it was a, it was a it was a party of eight, but like, like it was just that trio just ruining everything. Nah, you needed you needed four four thousand IQ plays from me and Chris. We were just not there. We would have helped you guys out. Dude, Adam's got to be criminal in games like that, dude. Adam's got to be tough to play with. And depending on what soap you get, you don't know. I mean, bro, I feel like Z and soap are just wild wild cards. You just don't know what you're gonna get out of those guys, dude. There's a clip of Z yeah, trying to play bad. Tetris last night. And dude, it's it's bad, Chris. It is fucking bad, yeah, dude. I don't even know if I want to watch uh, that. I might, uh, I might get annoyed watching it. We might need to. What we might need to do is we might. I might need to take soap and Z and Adam to like an escape room and film it because I think that would be fucking dude. The <laughs> arguments that would break out between those three, Adam and soap specifically, would be next level gold. Bro, it's so good. Yeah. MC, didn't we? Didn't you and I go to an escape room? Didn't wasn't it me, you, Ace, and Trey? Didn't we go to an escape room in yeah, fucking Frisco? I think we. I think we might have. Yeah, we did some train thing in fucking there's McAllen or something outside of uh, Dallas where you kind of watched that shit. We were good, but I've also gotten costed by other people in escape room. So I want to back up before we do mm -hmm. roster mania stuff. I yeah. want to cover a topic that's not as fresh, but I do think people were asking. I tweeted out for like questions, and this actually got asked quite a bit. Um. I think to both of you, and I'll start with you, Chris, like, mm -hmm. uh, obviously a slight format tweak this last season from the season before going from four majors to five majors and the best of seven finals with best of nine grand final. Like, what were your thoughts on the CDL uh, season now? And like, would you change anything in the format or want to have a discussion on certain things changing a format this off season? Um, I like the format for the most part. I thought five majors was better than four. I think anytime you get more competition is always going to be better, especially players and all that stuff. So I did like that. I thought that was really cool. Um, that was kind of like what we did in what Cold War. We had five majors. I know some of them were online yeah. because it was still like the COVID time, but still, yeah. I think that's kind of where you want to be uh, when, in the sense of how many majors a year before champs. The only thing I would say I didn't like <clears throat> um, was just the online to land points. I want to say that only two teams or maybe three i think new york might have snuck in there with major five were positive <clears throat> in points on land compared to online like a majority of teams got way more points in their final seedings online than land and like i think the land should have some sort of just more credibility you know online play is still pretty fair you know i've defended that for a while now but 
I do think at the end of the day, going to a tournament and backing it up and showing out is really important. Like I think that going to, I think going into a tournament and getting 12th, but then going five and zero, oh, like it kind of, it's not a big deal. If you go five and zero oh online or like four and one online, getting 12th at a tournament is not the end of the world where like, I feel like it should be. And I also feel like if you win one, I feel you should, that should be a lot. Or if you just go and get top six or top four, like those points should be way he I guess it's heavier. Like those should be more important than the, uh, the online matches some way, somehow. So they got to figure that out for sure. And then the champs final, I liked as well. I thought everything was pretty good with champs. I thought, the, you know, I think the winners should have a slight advantage, but in this final specifically, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. I liked it. I thought, it was, I, I thought it was a step in the right direction. So, I agree with you on the finals. I like the best of seven finals this year for regular events. I think they keep things fresh. The best of nine is really long, and then you end up in these like complete yeah. one-sided blood series. So, I think they keep that again. I like the best of nine finals for champs. Uh, the points allocation thing is crazy. I'll give an example team. This is not the shit talk this team, but I think we talked about this specific team and about this issue maybe like two episodes ago is Boston. Because yes. if Boston didn't yeah. have all those online points, they're not making champs this year because they only got like 50 points online this season. So I think figuring out that online points allocation versus land points allocation and what that means reducing the number of online points from 10 to say seven or five, maybe you get like a 3-0 bonus or something or increasing the land points, especially if you place like top six and above, you make it to the weekend. They need to look at it. I assume a big KPI for them. I know I say KPI like a key kind of thing they're trying to target is still trying to make sure that they don't make a point system where things are all decided before major five. That was sort of an issue in past years. And so making it more exciting than down the stretch. So I think they got to figure it out. Cause I, I don't know. I think this year, especially with the difference between online and land, a bunch of teams like definitely did not back up the most important parts of the season and made it to champs by, you know, the skin of their teeth. Cause they were winning matches online from their facility. Yeah. What do you think MC online or land as a well, player? Yeah, what do you think? What are you saying, like land, like like what? Like just like like points and like match, like just like matches and stuff, like how we play like the online matches and obviously the land. Like, how how much weight do you think, on, like from a player's perspective, oh. online should be like points wise and all that stuff, or like do you yeah, think it I doesn't mean, matter? What do you think? I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I honestly feel like I feel like land should like matter a lot more than online. I feel like online sometimes like, um, the points is like kind of the same on land, but I feel like land should definitely be more points given than like online. You know, yeah. I feel like online like matters a lot. Or events when like it should be more like more of the land matches that matter more, you know. Mm -hmm. no, I feel you. I didn't know if you. I didn't know if you <clears throat> felt like a huge difference or not. I mean, I know most players are obviously going to say land. Everyone wants to go to the yeah. big stage and perform and stuff. But yeah, yeah, I do. I do agree. I I think that's like the only thing right now that's like kind of hurting the format is just <clears throat> I think you get too much, like you 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 get away with too much just like performing online and like showing up to land and not doing that well. Honestly, even yeah. Seattle was relatively. Kind of the same, or am I, or am I faded for saying that? I know they had a really no, good first Seattle, event, but then for the next like four first. majors, I feel like they played really bad on land, right? No, they or got no. decent points at major. They got they got decent points at major four. Did they? And they got decent decent points at major three. They just major two is really bad for them. Oh, I thought they I, I thought they did worse, and maybe I didn't. So yeah, maybe, maybe no, no. Maybe Boston was Boston was. The I know Boston was the worst. I know Boston yeah. was always the worst. Yeah, uh, but Seattle got some points, and they also had a lot of bad online splits too that's how they ended up kind of being at the bottom but i, yeah. I agree with you. i think that's a big thing for the owners and comp ops and obviously i assume you guys have sort of a feedback process well, too with with the league on like yeah. trying to get that through and finding a better way to tweak this point system so we de-emphasize online call of duty especially in the sound eq era yeah and i also have a question well not a question i have a, i have a question in the chat what if winning a major guarantees your spot in champs see i don't I like I, I like the idea of something like that, but I also hate it because like if you win major one or even major two, like one of the earlier majors, I guess yeah. it could be the same for like later majors too. I just don't think you should be able to just suck for the rest of the year. And like weirdly enough, you would say like if you can win a major, you probably won't suck for the rest of the year. But we kind of saw it with LAG and Vanguard, and then like even like obviously Seattle didn't win, but they had a really good first major. They were in a final, and then they like struggled for a lot. Like I don't think you should be able to just like solidify your spot in champs with only one win because if you do win a major realistically you have to try not to qualify for champs after that meaning you have to 100%. be very bad and like if so you can't qualify like that should be your guarantee without being the guarantee if that makes any sense like so if you can't qualify 
for champs after winning one. I don't think that's like a format issue where it's like, oh, well, he, they should be a guaranteed in because they won one. I think that you just deserve not to be there, right? Like, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm very curious what Daniel Side thinks about this because he was a commissioner of the NBA 2K League in their initial inaugural season. They basically had this happen. The uh, Knicks gaming team was pretty fucking mediocre and they ended up winning one of the like final tournaments mm. to get into, into the, get into playoffs and then they won playoffs. So like... They kind of didn't have enough points, but they back into that because they won yeah. that tournament. So, like, that's a practical example of how that works. I agree with you. Like, there are different ways to tackle this. Like, Halo, Halo's approach to the major one problem is they did a points decay last year. So, basically, all the points that you would earn in the beginning of the season decayed by, by the spring. I don't really think you can do that in the CDL. Yeah. This is not really, like, a big open format. But I do think definitely stuff could be tweaked with this points allocation thing. For sure. I just think the league's not going to do anything about the difference between online delay and especially in regards to sound EQ and the fact that, you know, the g- games always play a little bit different pace wise from online to land, but this year, especially, and you, I assume you agree, MC, like playing online with sound EQ is completely different from playing on a stage. Like it's a, it's yeah. a big issue now. And that is cringe, very cringe. I mean, it happened last year. Like I think LG, <laughs> I, I freaking LG won an event. And then I think, I think they got beat by like a team that won a lot more online than that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Than yeah. like they did. Yeah. And they, and they made champs because of it, which kind of like... See, that also shouldn't be a it, thing either, yeah. Yeah, it, it should not be a thing. Like, that's what so, I mean, like, they definitely played worse, but, like, yeah, a team that is just frying online shouldn't also be able to, like, beat out a team on... Like, that's why they just need to find the, the allocation of the points just a little better, because... Yeah. If you want to win an event and then, like, not qualify by sucking for the rest of the year type thing, it shouldn't be by getting beat out by teams that also aren't good on land. They're just winning a bunch of online matches. You know what I mean? Like, there has to be a better way to do it. And then also Troy, aka Sender, aka World Champion Coach of New, at New York Subliners, uh, I guess. said like <laughs> said the same thing like for Florida, but like on the opposite way. Like Florida was kind of just like not that good all year, and then they looked really good towards the end of the year. They make this crazy run. They didn't win, but like if they were to have won at the end of the year, I guess the way I view that is just like you know you also can't really afford to start the year so slow. So it's like it shouldn't be a guarantee. But if they kept themselves like serviceable all year and then they won that last one, they could back in that and obviously get into the champs and stuff like that. So I, I just think winning lands should just mean more and then the yeah. online matches should mean less. And I think if they were to do that the right way, everything we're talking about right now kind of fixes itself. That's that's yeah. how I view it. So yeah, I think it's pretty easy. Dan says like land win should be 15 plus. I think adding more land points, again, we we'll probably talk about this in a more off-season episode once we get yeah, back to yeah, WrestleMania. Yeah. We're going to shit to talk about. Mm. But I like Dan's kind of thinking of like, I don't know how much you can do the online side, but like the land side, definitely increasing the points haul, definitely. Well, ideally, uh, benefit the teams that play good online. So yep. uh, anyway, let's let's move on. Um, yep. Before we get into like your guys' team in particular, um, <laughs> we're gonna, this is the first WrestleMania world topic we'll talk about. So I'm going to ask this question. And we'll talk about your guys' team, and then we'll talk about a bunch of other stuff. Okay. There is uh, an overall sentiment that has been uh, set on the flank. I've also seen on some other people's streams saying this, that the way that this offseason is set up, uh, that, um, you know, like, we there were probably, like, five teams at the end of the season that were really, really good. Um, you know, obviously, Seattle wasn't one of those, and they kind of battled hard at champs to place the way they did, so I want to tip that. Um, but some people are saying that with this offseason that the league is going to become top-heavy again. I'm just curious, like, at a macro level, Chris, we'll start with you. Do you think that's true, or do you think people are just kind of gassing, like, the initial stage of roster mania and saying that, but seeing what, like, some of the other teams are building? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I see why people are saying that, and, I, like, you know, I understand where that thought comes from. I really think it depends on the game that comes out. I, I, truly, I truly think the Call of Duties that we've played in the CDL have been... Uh, interesting to say the least um you know in the sense of just like certain games are so different like you look at like cold war black ops 4 like those two games specifically you have extra health you have a lot more bullets that have to land on the people that you're shooting and i feel like that like a game like that will be top heavy depending on the rosters built because of just the talent that it requires like you see like more of a skill gap the more bullets that you have to hit in gunfights the more skill gap that you're going to have with talent the more that you're going to see that difference between team shotting and teamwork and obviously just like skill being able to get those kills and create like crazy stuff like that but then you have a game like you know mw 2019 and stuff where it's like a lot faster time to kill and i feel like or even mw2 it's like those games were a lot of like i think teamwork 
reactivity of the what's going on like you know really being like in the zone of like what you guys need to do like being on the same page and stuff like that and i don't think talent always trumps that you know what i'm saying like in the games like that's like they do they help no matter what they will be like top heavy on paper but my point is like depending on what game comes out i really think it just depends on you know that because i i don't think it'll be like crazy like top heavy no matter what rosters are formed if the game is just depending on it's just so it's so hard to tell but i, I do think with what i just said i do think the rosters this year might be the best that the cdl has seen on the top if like they are rumored to be true and like everything comes out the right way you know what i mean so i do i do see why people are saying that but yeah. I don't think it will be as drastic as people are saying, unless like next year, if the game comes out with extra health or something like that, then I definitely think there will be. But it really depends on the COD that we're playing because you never really kind of know like what the hell is happening with that. Do you agree, MC? Yeah, I agree. I I, I feel like the like the faster TTK like TTK games are like a lot more like less skill gappy. So like I feel like anyone not anyone can win, but like it's a lot easier for like the like the like the lesser skill gap teams to win, you know. But mm. I mean, honestly, it depends <laughs> on the game. Like Crowder, so like. The spawns, like spawn, like fucking squad spawns, all that shit, was, like kind of crazy, you know, to like look back on. So, I mean, it just depends on the game. And let me let me spin another way, Chris. Yeah. Um, do you think that teams might overcorrect this year? This game, obviously, there wasn't a lot of third sub, fourth sub opportunities in a lot of situations. It was AR heavy. Do you think a number of teams might make a mistake this year, like they did going into Mono Warfare for 2019, where they're going to try and bank? on a 2A or 2-sub game and not really give themselves the flexibility if it becomes like a faster third-sub game in a lot of situations? Um, maybe. Maybe not. I feel like, again, if you look at flex players, a lot of the really good flex players are able to run a sub at a very high level. And, like, so you, you will always have, like... I think a lot of that goes to the flex player you're looking at. Like, yeah, you should always be able to have that second flex that can pull out a sub and be really useful with it and all that stuff. And I think that's, like, really important. I don't think people will overcorrect with that. Um, I don't think that's how it's going to go. Um, I just feel like it, people are going to try and get like the most talented roster that they can possibly get. And with what I just said, it becomes like if the more talent you have and the more flexible everyone is on the team, the more what game comes out next shouldn't really matter. You know what I mean? You don't want to have like, I feel like roles are slowly getting outdated in Call of Duty to a point. You know, you don't want to be Z as your main AR. Uh, you, like obviously but like you definitely want people that can kind of do both like tyler can run an ar like he pulls out ar when needed like uh, everyone can like even i guarantee you if hydra pulls out an ar which he did a lot uh, like on on new york like when he needed to pull out an ar he would on holds and it would work like there's a lot of times like all these players can kind of do a little bit of everything so i feel like when you're going for a really really high caliber roster that's what you're going to want is people that can run their main role really goddamn well like some of the best in the world but then also be able to switch up when you need to. So I think that's like a yeah. big thing that like people kind of always go for. So I don't think people will overcorrect with that. And then also just to like bring, bring it back one step before, like with games that like have the faster TTK with like, with what MC was saying, like, yeah, it's not like, it's not like anyone can win because that's not true either. Like London wasn't winning championships last year, but I'll say one thing. I feel like matches like London versus anyone, even like us, I think we played a close 3 0 with them once too. But like, yeah. my point is, like, those matches in a game like Black Ops 4 weren't even fun to watch, in my opinion. I feel like most of the time you watch a match like that, like Black Ops 4 with a lot of health or something, it was just like, oh my God, this is about to be a goddamn brueler of just like 3 0, like massacre. Yeah. In games like this, it becomes a lot different because I feel like the, the physical just way you kill people is just so easy. Like, anyone can pre in the doorway and shoot, shoot two bullets to get the kill. So, it's like, I feel like it's just a completely different style. But, like, at the same time, like, that's not taking it away from anybody. Because at, the, at that time, you still need teamwork. And yeah. you still need to be able to kill people, bro. Killing people in this game, even when it is easier, is still really hard. Because they can kill you just as fast. So, it's like, there's so much to it. But, yeah, I, I think those kind of teams just, like, have way more of a chance when you're doing something. Like, when you have those games. So, I do think we have to kind of wait and see for that. But yeah, I don't think people are going to overcorrect, Ben. I think people are going to go for talent that can use anything. Like, I, I truly think that's, like, what a lot of people try to build their roster around. You don't want to just have, like, people that can only use one thing. That's getting very outdated. What yeah. I would say is, I agree with you. I think for the for the people that have roster flexibility, aka they have options, I don't think they're going to make this mistake. 
Yeah. But I do think some, you know, when we'll get to it, there are a number <clears> of teams <throat> that are in like a starting over situation and they're so far down the domino chain that they might, they might have to like choose between the players that have certain limitations. And like, I guess my question is more to them. It's like, do you, if you have the option to go with the sort of two ARs, but they're like a questionable third sub, you're going to take that risk over maybe someone who's not as good, but like if it becomes a faster game and it's a three sub game, not going to be fucked. You'd have to, you'd have to give me an example because yeah. it, it just depends on a, how good your AR is like, you know, cause if you're getting two ARs that can really hold it down as an AR and like kind of be aggressive, but like still like, you know, be impactful with it, maybe. But if you're getting someone that's like not that great of an AR and then like also, you know what I mean? Like it just, or you're getting someone that's not that, not that good, but they can use a sub. You have to kind of like balance out your options. It just really depends on like who you're looking at on paper, to be honest. 100%. 100%. So, uh, okay. I want to ask you guys a question. So obviously I'm not going to sit here and be like, who's face picking up? Cause you're not going to answer that question. Cause he's not going to answer that question, but I want to <laughs> ask you this way, because I think this is never really gets talked about and you guys don't make a lot of changes as a team. So I think this educational segment, people are going to really like my question to you guys. And I want to start with MC first, your perspective, because you guys have only made a number of roster changes. How do you guys normally approach making changes in the off season, start to finish, like thought process, talking to the coaches, talking to ownership, getting players. Like how does it work from your perspective? Just kind of educate people that are tuning in. For our team. Well, yeah. I, like for our team, I obviously like, our team is like like our team only wants to win, you know. Like if we don't win champs, and there's obviously like there's gonna be talks about roster, you know. So, um, I mean that's just how it is. Like if we don't win most events throughout the year, it's just gonna how it's just there's gonna be talks no matter what. It's just how how like, our team operates pretty much. So, um, I mean that's what happened after this year. Like our team only won one event, which is like not like it's not us, you know. Our team should be winning like multiple events with the talent we have. So after after the champs, we, like our team just had talks with each other and just. Decided that it was time to like just take a different option, you know, just take a different route. So, so how does it go down? Like maybe Chris can touch on this. Is this like a you guys all sit in the, like exit meeting with the players and the coaches, and you talk it through? Then you go to management, and you say you want to get X, Y, and Z, and then they kind of take it from there. How does it sort of go from your perspective, Chris? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of the times rosters go like I I I feel even when I was a player like. The players are always going to be very impactful with roster changes, obviously, because you want your players to play with people that they are confident or they want to play with or they can win with, you know what I mean? Like, or whatever they feel. So I, I, I think it stems from players always wanting to make sure like they have the best roster for next year, depending on the options out there and just depending how the year went, you know what I mean? And then like, that's really what it is. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get there. I, I, if I could take a look at this outline, if I open it up again, I'm, I'm assuming you have questions about Austin. Yeah, it's the next so, question. So. Yeah, so I'll say, so I won't, I mean, I guess I'll let you ask the question, but it's like, yeah, like I think with our team this year, I mean, assuming that I'm still a part of the roster next year too, which I probably will be, but obviously I have to figure that stuff out too. But like all that is like, it just, we didn't really, we didn't have a bad year at all. I mean, this is the fourth time they've gotten the first seed. You know, they played very well. They won a major. Um, only one team won two or three, which was New York, which had an incredible year. And yeah. outside of that one major that we won, it wasn't really like we... Like, major five was great. They played really good. Unfortunate final. We didn't win search, whatever we lost. But, like, outside of that, we didn't get to the final again. You know, it's like we didn't look, like, super competitive on, the, on major three, major four, major one. Like, those Sundays... If you ask it from my perspective, I don't think we looked incredibly competitive. Now, I don't think that was Austin's fault. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like, so when we get to that, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that more in depth. But like, I just think the team wasn't clicking consistently enough to find ourselves competing to win a championship consistently enough either. Like, you know, that's just kind of how it went. Like, we got a lot of third places, which is not bad, but you also really want to win in this league. And I don't think the team was clicking consistently enough i guess that's the best way to put it to like win i, I feel like the way i view call of duty is like you want to be like call of duty can be day-to-day -day. like people talk about it all the time right like people say it all the time you can show up tomorrow yeah. and lose to london when london's obviously struggling that doesn't mean you're a bad team it like you're it's day-to-day -day, but like how consistently can you not be in that mode and how consistently can you be in the mode where like you're like being able to just get to the final and win or compete for the championship You're over and over. Yeah. Like floor, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you want to hit that ceiling more than you hit your floor. And like, I don't think 
this team was hitting their ceiling and like nearly enough. And like, again, we'll get to the point when I'm sure you asked other questions, but I feel like once that happens, you kind of look back and you're just like, all right, like, I think, you know, the players are going to want to take the next step and this is what the options are. Do we want to do this or do we want to do we not, et cetera, et cetera. And you move from there. I feel like it's like, kind of just how it goes. So before we get to the Austin thing, I want to dive into something. So like, you know, obviously you guys are going through a period where you're going to make a change. Like again, that collaborative process, is it the players come to you, uh, Chris and like Arch and say, we want to pick up X, Y, and Z, or is it more of like a group conversation? And then you guys, you know, go to like upper management and say, this is kind of our target list. And then they kind of advise what's reasonable and what's not. Uh, I guess it's like a little bit of both. It could be a group conversation, but a lot of the times I feel like it stems from the players also thinking like, you know, Hey, this is what's on our minds. What do you think? Do you agree or not? Cause like it, it would never kind of be the reverse role, at least how call of duty operates now, because say if I, you know, MC, <laughs> I was coming to you guys and like, you guys are happy as ever. And you guys don't want to make a change. You know, you had a little bit better every year. It's like, I'm not just going to go in there and be like, yeah, we're dropping Tyler. And everyone's gonna be like, no, we're not. You know what I mean, like it's like it's like you have to obviously be, you know, realistic about how how everything goes too. But like at the at, at the end of the day, the players that are playing the game matter a lot. Not always they can't like you know they, that there's worlds where they can be wrong too. But it's the same shit. Like I feel like it's like collectively everything. But I feel like it all stems from just like how how players are feeling. For you feel you like know, what Chris and MC I want you to follow because I think you've been around <clears> for a long time, Chris. Probably been on teams that like this and not like this. Do you feel like you guys are lucky because you have that cross collective as a group? And we've seen some other teams in the CDL when they make roster changes, it feels like either the coaches are doing it or the players are forcing the coaches to do it and everybody's sort of not on the same page. Do you feel like sometimes there'll be some conversation you guys are in between a player or two, but you feel like at the end everybody's satisfied with the decision and no one's like, you know, one's coming in with a closed mind or whatever you guys are doing going forward? Is that to me? Yeah, I want to start with you, and then I want to get MC's thoughts after you kind of answer. So you're saying, like, are we lucky because we have that environment? <clears throat> I'm not saying, are are you lucky? I'm hmm. just saying, like, like, do you feel that that's a correct characterization of your team? And do you feel uh, like not every team in the league has that has that kind of atmosphere? I don't know how other teams in the league operate. I don't know how other teams in the league how transparent they are with each other from management to coaching staff to players. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't know like the line of communication they have with us. Like I definitely like the fact that, yeah, like I, I feel like I can talk to every player on my team. Like and the players can talk to us or players can talk to management management can talk to me like, and kind of just be honest with each other and figure out like the best move slash how everyone's feeling etc cetera, etc cetera, before it, anything like kind of explodes you know what i mean i feel like you want an environment where if someone isn't happy or someone is uncomfortable they can say it and like you can get to the bottom of it immediately so it doesn't get any crazy like or or anything like that so it's like yeah i don't know like i like the environment we have i don't know if that's how every other team works like again some people force their coaches i guess to make the changes i don't even know what team you're talking about. I'm not sure, I, again, what other teams do, but yeah, I, f I feel like being able to communicate between each other, like adults, and just be honest and figure out the best move for the next, like for, your, for yourself or the people that are, don't want to be a part of your team or want to be a part of your team anymore is like super important, to be honest. MC, I know you've been on three teams in your career. One of them was an amateur team. I mean, I assume you kind of agree with Chris that like you guys are just... Like, when you guys want to make a decision, it's very collaborative, and it's been that way since the start, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's always been that way. I feel like our whole team's, like, very open to each other, so, any, any, like, if anything, like, needs to be said, like, like, someone will say, you know? So it's not like someone's, like, hiding like, stuff from each other. It's always, yeah. like, said. You're trying to try and be as transparent as you can be. I feel like as the years go on, I feel like it gets better and better, but I feel like that's, like, a super important skill to have, like, I guess in life. But, like, yeah, like, I, I feel like you need to be able to do that, because... You don't want anyone on your team, I guess from my my perspective, like business is business and at the end of the day, like, you know, contracts and all that stuff, you want everyone to be happy enough to play. Like, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to have a situation where like someone's just like miserable on your team or something because I feel like they then you won't get the best out of that player, et cetera, et cetera. But like, so it's like, yeah, you want, yeah, I feel yeah. like you just want to get everyone to their highest ceiling that you can be. And I, I feel like the 
comfort of just players and everything is important too, for the most part. Obviously, there is a line to that, but. <clears throat> So let's let's talk Austin then. Obviously, mm-hmm. he has been released. Uh, you know, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Do you like to speak on Austin's contribution in the season and sort of what maybe factored into sort of moving on from him going into this next season? Uh, I'm gonna start with one thing <clears throat> with Austin specifically. I feel like a lot of people, when we picked up Austin, a lot of people behind the scenes, the one question I'd get asked every single time was just like, "You ready to deal with slasher?" You know what I mean, and like I've dealt, I've dealt with Slasher before on during Black Ops Four, and yeah. I've, te- I've teamed with Austin in Advanced Warfare. I've, I've, you know, I've teamed with Austin. I've obviously we've been around each other. You know, for a super long yeah. time. We didn't yeah. team very well together, but that's because we were like even myself, like a little bit younger and a little bit more immature. But like now, <laughs> like I feel like when I dealt, like uh, when I worked with him in Black Ops Four, he was really good. And I feel like when I worked with him this year, like all like the attitude thing that people talk about him and like, you know, how he could be like, just like anything that you've ever heard about him, like attitudes wise, I feel like is like such bullshit now, at least from my perspective, I feel like he was one of the best teammates you could really ever ask for. And like working with him from a coaching's perspective was like really good too. Like he was, he, he, he did everything that like the team wanted him to do, to be honest. Yeah. Like I, I thought he was a really good teammate. I thought he helped the players get better. I think him being on the team for this year helps all the players like, you know, pers- like pursue their career farther. Like I, I think he did nothing but help us in that sense. So like I enjoyed having him on the team. I liked him a lot. I was definitely upset that like we were probably making this change in the sense of that for that reason. But I also do think like this roster wasn't fully clicking. And again, I don't think that's fully on Austin either. I'll say that publicly, obviously, even with MC here, like, I, I don't think it was just fully on Austin. We all, we all talked about that when we had the team talk too. like, I don't think this change, like, you know, whoever we pick up, it's going to be like, Oh, it's a magic fix. Like, I do think we have to get better as a team as well, like from within to a little bit. And yeah. I think that's the only way we're going to start winning at the level we want to. And I think that's a really big way to look at it too. But yeah, I, I, I thought Austin was amazing. I think he absolutely deserves a really good spot next year with a really good team. And I think he did everything we asked him to do. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, MC, he was your AR duo. Obviously, you know, you come with him a lot. Like, what were your thoughts on the team with Austin this year? This year, I mean, I, I'm freaking, I, I forget what I told you, but I said, like, this year, this year was the most prepped year I've ever had, like, hmm. most prepped and, like, most fun year I've ever had, like, practicing and stuff. Like, obviously, in Core, we won a lot, but I feel like Core, we just, like, out talented everybody but this this year like i feel like i felt a lot more prepped going into matches and like tournaments and stuff like that so and austin was a was a huge part of that too so i want to shout out him for that because he was actually gross and like he played his he played his role really well you know for like like the like, thing we wanted him to do so you speak on the prep thing i might give you guys an opportunity to address something we we had an episode of the flank last week and uh chris parasite <laughs> made a take that he felt like you guys got out prepared Fighter teams at points at the end of the season. Do you agree with that characterization, or do you think he's completely wrong? That's what yeah, I figured. Do you want to expand abs- on that? What do you want me to say? He's fucking wrong. Like <laughs> I, I did. That he can say he can he can say that we were out prepared. Anyone can say that from watching it from the outside looking in. But like there 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 is nothing that we weren't ready for at that fucking tournament. Plain and simple. The things that we did, the things that we did that lost our matches was not a preparation thing. It was lack of execution. You yeah. can say that for sure. But like it was not a prepared thing. Like we made mistakes in the controls that to this day I'm still not happy about. And like we made mistakes in here and there, but like when it came to like preparation, not a single team I didn't sit in the dugout once. And I and I I've had matches where I've sat in the dugout and a team is throwing something at me and I'm like, "Oh fuck." Like Damn, that's a you know I'm saying that's a good like that's a good thing like good play like good you know GGs to that. There was not one thing that we sat down in that dugout and we're not like all right that threw us off guard at all like I that we just didn't execute and it, that sucks to say but it's true. I think this champs was probably one of the best prepar- like prepared or one of the most prepared champs we've had. I just don't think we were you know I just don't think we executed plain and simple. So uh, he's completely fucking wrong. <clears throat> all right. Fair enough. Uh, I know there's obviously more to speak about on your team. We can get to it toward the end of the episode, but I want to make sure we cover 
We're gonna try and cover pretty much every other team in the CDL. I'm looking at the list. I think I have everybody, but like Tab, we skip over. We we only cover something for two minutes. Like I apologize, just eleven our teams in the league. We got a lot of Optic fans in here. Let's talk about Optic. Uh, you know, the Optic, I feel bad for Optic because this whole roster change thing with them is like been a seventh month process. Every Optic fan out there, or a lot of them have been talking about Optic Pride since like January. Uh, and obviously, you know, for Optic this year, you know, they, they made the roster changes. They got back to back seconds and the end of the season did not really go as expected for them. And they're clearly making changes. They released Van Gogh, they released Hook. Uh, I don't know the flex one. I think is we can get to in a second, but I think the more interesting conversation around optic is around the SMG. So I want to start with UMC. If you were optic right now, put yourself in, um, put yourself in your your duo Big Bruce shoes here. If you had the choice between Envoy and Pred and your optic, which one hypothetically would you pick up? Tom Dashi. Yeah, if you were if you were Bruce <laughs> right now, right? Swap bodies. Swap bodies are Bruce. You know. He's, he's taking your body, you're taking his body. Uh, who are you picking up? Well, it depends who my teammates are. Who are my teammates? So you got Ant, and obviously you need to get a flex player, but you're getting a sub player first. So let's just say that that's, that's the person you got to pick up first. All right, I got Ant. I got... I'll take... I don't know, bro. This is tough, because they're both really good players, you know? But yep. this is a tough... Envoy or Pred, if I had Shati. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll fuck it. I'll just take, I'll take Pred to be honest. Yeah, but you, but you agree though, and I think the sort of nuance in this conversation, you agree that it's definitely like, I think a lot of fans are trying to simplify it out there, and like obviously things are not black and white. And I think you would agree, MC, that it's like either option you go with if you're optic, you're probably still pretty good, right? Yeah, no, it's both. It's both really good options. Though, like, it's both still good options, and shit, you know. It's just a tough. It's a tough. It's a tough decision. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. You you agree, Chris? Because they definitely like. I think the the, the difficulty yeah. they have is their fan base. You know, wants to go one direction, but like Envoy also is someone that like was on Optic at one point, Optic Chicago, and like got dropped. Let's just for get... circumstances beyond his control. I mean, yeah, true. He was playing good in <sighs> Kawar, so I mean, there's two ways to look at it. I mean, I feel. I, I don't know who I was... Maybe I was talking to Sam the other day. I don't know. Who, who, we were talking about Envoy. But it just depends on... It's so hard to say it fully, I guess, like, you know, but, like, it depends on, like, your... your your team and, like, what you think your team needs and, like, what you think complements your players well, but Envoy and Pred are, like, two totally different players, yeah. if you ask me. Like, I, I think they're both really freaking good. I think Pred is incredible. You know, like Pred is obviously so goddamn good at what he does, and he's probably one of the best subs in the league. You know, obviously we know this. And Envoy yeah. is really good too, but like in different ways. And he is also one of the best subs in the league. It's just like I feel like Envoy is a sub player who can fry when needed. He will push out when needed. He'll apply pressure. You know, like he's he's very smart. He knows how to play Call of Duty. I think LA Thieves has a really good camp. Like the the LA Thieves team that's obviously splitting up right now. I think they all know how to play to win at the right and like play the right way. So, and like, I think he does like a little bit of everything with the sub. Like he gets a lot of hill time for a sub player. I would say more, more than others. He pushes out. Like, I think he's like a, a little bit of everything with the sub, which is good. Yeah. And then you have Fred who Fred's a big question mark for me in the sense of just like Fred averages like the least amount of hill time out of anyone in the league. And, yeah. and like he obviously gets a shit ton of kills and has a really good KD and you, you look at all that stuff he does have really good comms I actually think he has better comms than people think but like that was like Seattle's win condition we were talking about it with like I was talking about with Sam yesterday like Octane you know Pred, Pred had to do that to, to win with that Seattle team if he doesn't do that like I don't think that Seattle team really wins like it's just the way they, those guys were like kind of built like their mini map always looked really weird and yeah it's 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 more or less like do you think like Pred was do you know Pred was doing that because of that because he needed to like you know play with that specific team and kind of fry all the time like that's kind of like what they sent him out to do or was he doing that just because that's just how he plays COD you know what I mean I think I think he was probably doing that just because that was their win condition and that's how just like a lot of people play like just depending on the team that they have so to answer the question like I mean I think Shotzi and Pred are more similar than Envoy. And Envoy and Shotzi, in the sense, like, the way they play, but 
I think if you can get the right style, like the work, like they'd be really good with Pred too. But like again, I, I, I don't think there's a wrong answer there. So I, I agree because I want to address a couple of morons in my chat, probably in your chat too, on a couple of things. What? Uh I got no more in my chat right now. I got a couple. So <laughs> people were talking about the like Pred running away from Hill thing, and you know this, like Lamar's when he has like superstar players on his team, Lamar will tell like his sub player, like, bro, do not get in the hell. If the hell pops and I'm getting in it, I want you to run in the other direction mm. and start pushing out and getting kills. So like they have a very specific system they play, and I agree, like it makes things very funky. And I saw someone in my chat, Momo, bro, when I was a big Optic fan, was was putting <laughs> that they tried the Envoy experiment before and it didn't work. But like I I don't know how you feel, Chris, with Cold War Optic Chicago. I don't think Envoy was a problem on that team. What does that have to do they, with Yeah? Yeah. Like yeah, so like, because like they had a formal who was like, you know, Matt was obviously skunk. like, and Seth like they they had a team that like I think they had a lot of issues with their setup outside of Envoy. Like I don't think the Envoy was a problem on that team, and he got dropped because they merged with Dallas, and they were like, well, we only have one other sub spot, and Ant's wait. there. It's like Ant or wait. Envoy. Like which are we going with? I'm so confused right now. What are you confused about? They tried the Envoy experiment, and it didn't work. Like, but like I feel like that was just like a completely different. What? Yeah, it was a completely different team. In a, yeah. Two games ago. So what are we and talking he, and about? And he didn't play bad. That's what I'm saying. Like I think it's a whack take. Like to say, oh well, we should pick up Pred. Like they should go with Pred because they already tried with Envoy and they didn't win. And it's like, well, I don't. I think it's a the poor way of like looking at it. You know, I think Envoy was really good in the games that he was on in their team, and I think there were other circumstances that led to them not winning consistently. And I do think he's a legitimate option for them in this offseason. That's the point I'm trying to make. I don't know if no, you agree. It, no, I mean, yeah. I think he is a legitimate op option. I mean, it's it's hard to speculate outside of outside of the camp, uh, even with how much call duty I know and how much call do you guys. You know what I'm saying? No MC, same thing. Like, a, a lot of it, too, is also, like, people, I feel like people in roster radio like to slot people in and, like, yeah. be like, oh, on this paper, this guy's engagement and this guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, that all looks good and stuff like that is definitely important to to a degree, but... I mean, bro, like, so much more of it is, like, communication, teamwork, comms, culture. You know, so, like, there's, like, that stuff is, I don't care what anyone says nowadays, that that stuff is more, I mean, it might be more important than some of that stuff, to be honest with you. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like Toronto proved that pretty goddamn well by picking up Hixie. I feel like Toronto picked up Hixie instead of Standy, someone who gets significantly less kills than Standy. Not even like taking a slide at Hixie because like Hixie is a very good player. Like I think Hixie is one of the smartest players like that we had in the league last year. Like, and Hixie made them better. And yeah. that like, and that's just because like Hixie felt like fit that system and played like way more as a team. I'm sure the culture with Standy just wasn't that good. Maybe it wasn't Standy's fault. You know, like who knows what the hell was going on. But I'm just saying like that stuff is so important. Like that Toronto team got a lot better when they made that move, and everyone at the time thought that move was faded. Everyone and like again, you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes with so many other like so much other stuff. So it's like, yeah, no, I I think saying we tried Envoy and it didn't work is just like projecting. The, I don't even know what that is. Like that that makes no sense. Like that you can't use that anymore. But at the same time, like Pred is so fucking talented that I totally see why people are like obviously wanting to go down that route. If you're like you're an optic fan and stuff like that too. So it's like yeah, I don't know. I mean. They have like the European. This, this isn't. This happens a little bit in, in American sports, but like the worst example is like where I think it would be Europeans are going to agree. European soccer is like a good example of what's happened with this pride thing because like this room, this move has been hyped up for seven months, and now that like they're on the precipice of maybe thinking about it, you have like people that are like get it. They're like fans that were maybe on pride and now they got cold feet because there are other options out there or people that are doubling down just in the face of all of this. It's like a very and I feel bad for the team. They obviously always optic deals with just people having mega hot flaming takes about their team. It is what it is when you're in that organization. But like, yeah. but like this situation, the fact they didn't get him in January, but now he's available and they can get him. But there's other good options because you know I think to be clear about how this roster media has gone now, like Dante's obviously out there as a flex option. You've got the LA Thieves players. Like we don't know what's going on with Toronto. Like that's probably a lot of your top end available uh, free agents. There's a lot of different ways optic can go down this that. Include Pred and also don't include Pred. Mm -hmm. I think it's complicated. Yeah. So I, I'm curious to see what Optic do. I think my my think to fans though is I think looking at the options they have, I think 
I've seen some people say like, oh, Optics not gonna have a good team this year. I and I, I think Optics this upcoming season. I think their team's gonna be that. Just fine. Wait, Optics, hold yeah. up. The, who said that Optics not gonna have a good team this year? Listen, I'm like, I you know, obviously we're on phase, and you know, technically speaking, they're obviously the competitors and stuff. But like, whatever, whatever team Optic picks, they're gonna be good. Like what? Like that is that that I, I feel like that's insane to say. I don't think Optic can make a bad choice. I don't like. I don't think there's like again. I, I think a lot of the top teams right now are all going to be really good, no matter what choices are made. That's that's what I mean. Like, I personally think, like, yeah, to say Optic won't have a good team is fucking insane. And if they and if they don't have a good team, it's not because of the people they picked up. It's going to be something. It's going to be something more within. Like yeah, a, again, some, that's, some internal thing. Just like I just yeah. said with our team. Like, that is not. That's just really good. Not great. You're completely fucking wrong. But okay. It's Next, gotta commit yeah. because last last off season they pump faked the change and I just it it set yeah. them back like six months so I think they'll be a little more decisive around the last optic thing I want to talk about I want to talk I want to have you kind of go off the rip on this MC Dan Gosey so Dan obviously came in and they started playing way better with Dan they had a couple of runners up but obviously they decided to go in a direction you know playing against Dan what were your thoughts and like um where, what team would you like to see Dan go to next season MC. Uh, I mean, like, like obviously going up against Dan, I think he's a beast. You know, I feel like he's like, he's kind of like a like a Sam type of player. He like he goes in the hill and just like tries to like be like that IGL like turret, you know, in the hill. So I mean, I, I feel like he's really good at like just playing his role and how he like he just is in game and shit. But I also feel like he he changed his role like for that team because in challengers he was like fucking having like one point four, like just slaying out, just having like pushing out. You know what I'm saying? So, but like, yeah, I feel like I feel like Dan's like I feel like Dan could do it all. But he just played that role for that team. But I feel like seeing him on like LA Thieves or something like that, like that would be cool for like Sam Spot since Sam retired. So that'd be that'd be cool for him. I feel like like a top team like that. What do you think, Chris? I think uh, I I think so. What you just said about what what MC just said about Ghosty, I feel like is super underrated. I don't know if people are saying this, like Optic fans are saying this about him or not or whatnot. But like I think like in general, Dan joined this Optic team. And when he was on in the challengers with MC just said he was frying in challengers. Yeah. And then he joined this team and was not. And like I'm not saying he wasn't. He was also, trying. He was also flying in Vanguard as well. well so he that's what I mean. He, he can slay yeah. he can slay is my point of that. When he yeah, joined yeah. this team with Shotzi and Dashi and Hook, especially like three people that are all really good slayers, obviously you're not gonna you're not joining a team with Dashi and saying, like, step aside, I got the slaying now. It's not happening. Yeah. And you're not joining a team with Shotzi and Hook and saying, like, step aside, I'm going to start pushing out. Shotzi, you get into my hill. Like, it's not happening either. Like, I feel like he showed a lot about himself as, like, a player to be able to join this team and, like, change his role and change the culture and do whatever it takes to win. And I know it sounds easy to do when you join a team like Optic, like, you're just going to, you know, take, like, the, the, just the, the dirty work role and do it, but a lot of people don't like doing that stuff. And that's a, that's a big reason why a lot of teams don't win so i feel like his stats this year are super hard to look at in the sense like if you're looking for slaying because i think he can actually slay a lot heavier than he did yeah so i i think i think dan's a lot better even statistically than we even think right now and i also think what he did with his optic team this year shows you a lot about him and how willing he is to win and do whatever it takes and his communication was good so like i I think danny was uh, danny there dan i think dan ghosty jesus was uh start calling danny yeah (laughs) I think he was. I think he was really good. Honestly, I I think like he showed a lot this year with like all that stuff. So, I personally think like I don't know what's next for him right now, but I I think whatever team he lands on, hopefully it's a good one. Like I I would like to see him like now compete. I, I I would like to see him compete now a little bit where he plays the role a little bit more of like what he was doing in challengers just to see like yeah. what he's actually capable of, but. Yeah. I think I think Ghosty yeah. was a lot better than people even gave him credit. I know he played good at champ, so people were giving him credit there. But I think for a lot of the time, like you saw Dan this year, like he was around like a one point oh to a point nine with a lot of hill time. I think he did that because he that was like optics win condition. And I think like now you're gonna see a lot him play a lot better. But I'm curious to see, so we'll we'll kinda have to wait and see. I think uh <clears throat> there are a lot of good situations Dan can into get into. He could be a big part of some of these like full white rebuild situations going on. He could be a really good piece. Or something like Boston, who are like close and they need like one or two changes to get there, or an LA Thieves situation, you know, like they've got a pretty good coaching staff. They're gonna get some turnover and we'll get to it in a second. Like 
he can be a good contribution. Or maybe we'll, I'll think we'll bring him back. There's always the option that they may decide to resign him. So we'll see what happens with Dan. Uh, I'm excited to see his career going forward. Let's talk about LA Thieves. Um, bit of a funky end of the season. You know, we all, so going into the season, they did not offer extensions or as far as I know, I don't think there's any real conversations that were significant on getting the team re-signed for another year. So that was a bit of an interesting this situation. Um, so going into this season, it was clear they were going to all become free agents unless somehow new deals got dropped. That didn't happen. Um, they had a really rough end of the end of the season. Like they obviously played really well at major four. And then it was just kind of downhill from there. Um, ending with sort of a dead last placing a champ. So I think that's kind of maybe the catalyst how this team's sort of breaking up now. It seems like Envoy and Draws are maybe going to some other top teams. Not sure what Ken's doing. Obviously, Octane is now retired from professional Call of Duty. And we'll get to Sam in a second and kind of talk about his career. LA Thieves. Uh, I'm going to start with you, MC. You're Cap and Shane, because obviously all your players are now not on the team. So you got to basically on the coach's side kind of put the team together. Put your put your J Cap hat on. What kind of team would you try to build right now? So I'm squad season? wiping right now. This, let's assume squad wipe. They're all free agents, so there's no one on your roster right now. So would you bring back some of those players, or like you, you know, you're trying to rebuild? Like, what are you doing? I mean, yeah. I mean, if I'm Shane or J Cap, I'm, I'm I'm gonna try to like, like keep the three that you know that like that one Vanguard champ. So if you can, let's say hypothetically, right, you know, draw on like go to Phaser Optic or whatever. Like, and you got maybe Ken left. Like, what kind of team are you building around Ken? Or maybe Ken's just a piece and you're building around someone else. You said Ken. Okay, I'll, I'll play Kenny. And I can't get Envoy draws? Yeah, let's just assume for this, this scenario that Envoy and draws are going elsewhere. I'll get Kenny. Uh, I don't even know the agents, but free agents, bro. Like, I really don't. <laughs> Dante. You got Dante, Pred. Um, who else? I mean, there were a lot of people that were released. Like everybody in Minnesota got released. Everybody on Seattle is a free agent, obviously. A big wakes out there. He got released. You know, and Vivid are also out there. Uh, all the LAG subs got released. So there's like, uh, I think what sixty percent of the league got released or something like that. Something crazy. So they have a lot of players to choose from, and like they're also there's a situation, right? Hypothetically, situation where obviously you know if your team sorts optic sorts, like these are probably the next best destination in terms of like prestige teams so i think they can ideally get a lot of the players that they want theoretically who would you go you think all do you think austin maybe goes back to la thieves oh austin's a good pick yeah austin's a good pick you could do austin or like dan or like wake or something like that you know so yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of options for like like the teams like that chris you obviously know cap very well you know shane very well yeah. um considering the sort of where some of the rumors are right now what do you think you would do if you were in their shoes as far as, as, far as this rebuild goes? Um, I mean, I feel like when you're building a roster, you go for subs immediately. Like I, I feel, yeah. I feel like, I feel like you, no matter like your AR, ARs are important and you know, flex is important. Main ARs are important, of course, but like the people that are pushing out and going crazy on the map and like finessing their lives and stuff are like, you, you need that. It's very hard to win without that. So I, I feel like, that's probably what they're going to shoot for. It's just like the best sub duo that they can get right now, no matter what it is. And then they'll probably kind of fill in the gaps from there. It depends if they keep Kenny. I don't know if they are. Like, I don't know what they're doing. It depends if like, you know, if they can't keep draws and envoy or whatever too. Like, yeah, I mean, obviously Pred's a free agent. We just talked about that. I'm sure I'm assuming they're going to try and want to get him too, if they could, just because like, he's yeah. going to be someone that you can obviously build around. But like, I feel like the style of LA Thieves has always just really been like, you know, being aggressive, really good teamwork and all that. You're just like trying to like apply pressure on the map. And it's very hard to do that without an envoy. It's very hard to do that without a pred. You have saying it's very hard to do that with like, the, you need someone to be able to do that to lead that charge. So I feel like that would be big. So I'm assuming that's probably what they're going to shoot for. I don't know what that looks like for them or like what their realistic options are. And you also have to remember how money is a big thing too how much money you're willing to spend and contracts yeah. and all that stuff obviously i don't think anyone's like you know killing it there too so it's like how much money are they trying to willing to spend to like get these people and then like go from there and then i can yeah like slotting in ar a ars i think will be a little bit easier i do think austin like what i was just saying is a really good main ar he was really easy to work with 
you give him the right subs, he's going to give you a good team. You know, like we, again, we had a good year this year. It wasn't like, you know, the perfect year where we wanted to contend more, like we just said, but it's still really good. Like, he's, uh, he's out there too. There are some flexes that you can get. Like, there's a lot of options you can get creative with. So I feel like that's probably what they, that's probably going to be their mindset though, is just to try and like get the people that will apply the pressure for them and then slot in the right people around that. And then I do think like, their culture in that that camp will always be good with the coaching staff that they have yeah and they'll kind of go from there so it just really depends on who they can get like and all that my i agree with you chris because like first off you know obviously austin's got a lot of history with that org um you know you guys you obviously coach their team on black ops 4 and they brought some of the earth you know first championships to 100 thieves Mm -hmm. i know his la thieves tenure didn't and I think the best, but you know, whenever I talk to Austin, I'm not sure if it ever come up with you, but like, I think he learned a lot from how that situation went down. I think that's why he's improved a lot as a teammate from some of his earlier, you know, exploits, like when he was on Rise Nation in World War II. Um, but I agree with you. Like, you can't the way the league is right now. If you do not have elite sub players, you're not winning. You're not going to compete. You can maybe fluke in like a top four if everybody's clicking on a given weekend. You know what happens to the teams without elite subs is those are the teams when Sunday comes around, they get absolutely trounced because the other teams are just way better skill wise. But we just said though, it's just the same thing yeah. of like, you know how I was talking about how you want to like hit that ceiling more than you hit that floor. When yeah. you, when you, when you're, pl- when you have it, like the whole, the way I've always viewed talent is like the whole like S tier category or like Z tier, you know, like with the Octane's list, like there are a lot of players that can play at a very high level in this pro league, even some of the quote unquote lesser subs that aren't as good as like, you know, your, your, your typical S tier subs, but like, yeah, how many, how, how often are they going to hit that level where they're just flowing and dominating? It's like that, that's what like sets these people apart from hitting that ceiling more and more. And like, if you don't have that on your team, yeah, like you're going into a Sunday hoping that your subs and like your, your, your players are firing in all cylinders. And that's probably like a three out of 10 chance, right? Like you're, 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 the odds are just against you at, at all times. And like, even if you do that once for the year, that might be the only time you get it. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, like I, I think like your subs and stuff, like what you said, like showing up to a Sunday, like you need those guys to like try. And most likely the other three teams that are in the tournament, when you make it to that Sunday, if it's top four <laughs> are the likes of a BZ Sim, Shotzi, Envoy, like the Pred, yeah. all these guys, like. You got to compete with those guys. And if you don't have those guys, it's very hard too. So it's like, I do think like that's a very big part of it too. Like it's very hard to, to win without that. And like, yeah, I, I don't know. I just think for thieves though, here's the interesting thing for thieves. So you know mm-hmm. that uh, Matt, AKA Nate Shots got his podcast. He did an episode this week or last week. I don't remember. He was talking about sort of a more macro view of his org going forward. And he basically said like, I don't know who's going to be on the roster and all of our teams next year. I think he was kind of hinting that I don't think that they're looking at this off season across all their teams to just spend amazingly large cash to get those players. They might pick the can on a couple of things to next year. So I'm very curious about thieves go, are they going to try and go for the fast rebuild here and just make like the most competitive team they can build and spend, I don't know. I'm going to make a number like a million dollars. It's probably not a real number, but I'm just making up a number. Or are they going to identify a couple of key players you think are long-term teams and then kind of figure it out throughout the season. And if the season works great, um, if not, then next year they figure it out. I'm just very curious the route they go. Cause the sub market, the SMG market to your point, as far as like top tier subs is not super packed right now. A lot of people are locked down. There are elite subs available, but they thieves might, they might even get to thieves, you know, yeah. in the situation. So I'm serious, curious are, what they do. Have yeah. there been any intel on them or no? No, I mean, that's the problem. Things are just slow right now. Yeah. Like y'all got to, I mean, I'm not going to put you guys on the spot, but you guys obviously as a team, you think you guys are one of the first dominoes to go and it doesn't seem like you guys have made the decision or at least publicly said what you're doing. I don't think optic has either. And those are the two teams I think that always set the market as far as, you know, free agency goes. So you know, that's kind of why things are sort of at a standstill right now. And someone like these have got to wait to see sort of how the options sort of trickle down and the domino effect. Yeah, no. So I feel I I feel like that's the biggest question with these, though, is what you just said. How much are they willing to spend? Because yep. if they're willing to spend a lot of money, they can go out and get the likes of some of these top tier subs. Obviously, the money will be there. LA Thieves is LA Thieves is one of the best brands you can play on in Call of Duty. 
You know what I mean? Like it, it, they're they're so prestigious to be on. So it's 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 not like they have everything going for them, other than probably LA tax. Like literally, you get to live in LA, you get to play on that organization and all that stuff. Like that there, and they have really good coaches. Everything else, the content's amazing. Like they're a really good team. But yeah, like it just depends on how much they're willing to spend to get these people. And I know just the way market yeah. is like obviously it's just like a weird time right now so it's like yeah it just depends on like their strategy of how they go with that and also with the slasher thing yeah he didn't end the last 100 thieves or la thieves uh camp very well but i'm gonna be completely honest that team was a shit show from the start i was 100 yeah, percent like show. I, like i'm sure everyone involved in that roster was in the wrong at one point in the time. You know what I mean? Just like, I feel like that was just like a shitty year. Nothing worked. They couldn't get anything going. That was their first year in the CDL. Right? The first, the first LA Thieves That's year. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean, like they made 70,000 changes. That's what I like. I, I just feel like that year specifically, just, I think everyone learned a lot from that. And again, like what I was talking about, Austin, like I can personally say like, yeah, I don't know. He, like, I don't think that was, I wouldn't be worried about something like that again. I think everyone yeah. got better from that scenario too. I, I really do I've have a lot of good things to say about him. So yeah, I think he would be fine even if he went back to them. I would say, you know, not to make a Spider-Man joke, but that was a can of, big can of moment for that organization because I've talked to Cap about this in Austin. Like, I think they learned a lot of lessons from that Cold War year because they weren't unified in the changes they were wanting to make and they were just going down the spiral to just make changes to make changes. And they learned after that year of like, now we got to like, we got to commit to what we want to do to make our team play best. And it may mean for an event, we're going to suck but as long as we stay at it and ignore all the haters. And we know our team can win, but we're going to be good. And they did that obviously last year, they didn't have the best of starts, but they stuck with it and they were the best team at the end of the season and won. So hmm. I think thieves is always gonna be a destination. I'm just curious what this roster may and what they do. And I think it'd be a big reason why this uncertainty is obviously octane is now retired. I want to start with UMC. Um, Thoughts on Sam as a competitor playing against him, and any kind of words you have for him retiring now? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think I think Sam was like a beast. Like he's, I, I, I feel like Sam could have played like a few more years because he was still like on top of his game. So, I feel like him retiring on his own terms, like is like, it's like it's it's cool to see, you know, like just him like retiring, just like and just and just leaving the COD scene, you know, or not COD team, but like competitive, playing. like yeah. yeah, just playing pretty much, but. I mean, I mean, I mean, he was a beast playing versus him. He was, it was cool, you know. But I, I was honestly hope he does good in the content, you know. Cause I feel like he's very like funny and shit like that. So I mean, I, I honestly hope he does well. Yeah, he is he is definitely a funny dude. I mean, calls with him and Ian though, and I just get trolled consistently. But it's all good. That's gonna happen more often now. Chris, obviously, you've coached Sam. Thoughts on his career and what's next? I hate that he retired. To be honest with you, I, I like, I like, I listen. I, I know why. Like, I get why he did in the sense of like. I get it. I, I fully understand. Like, he, he, like you know, scrims and everything. Like he he did he did everything he wanted to do. He won the world championship. But like what MC said, like he's so fucking good, bro. You know what I mean? Like I think I think Sam is so good. And I also do think he's one of the few players in the league right now that have like comms as good as his and stuff too. You know what I mean? Like I feel like he provides like so much more than just like gun skill nowadays. So it's like I know why he retired. I respect why he retired. And like him retiring makes sense if that's like how he was feeling i think content is a lot like more fun i think he's gonna kill content i feel like what mc said he's really funny he's really good at content he's been building that brand wise a player he's been smart about it like he's gonna do really well and i'm happy for him so like uh, you know working with him has always been really fun too like in black ops 4 he was really fun to coach he's really good he shoots really straight but like yeah i do wish like he played a couple more years out of the, like the selfishness of just watching him play i think he's really good and i feel like he has like you know plenty more championships left within him if he did but at the same time like yeah if you're not feeling it then you can't do it so it's like a part of me is just like almost like sad he did because of how good he is but at the same time like yeah but competing even against him like when i was a player bro like yeah dude he shoots pretty straight he's he was like one, yeah. probably one of my least favorite people to shoot against in call of duty even like when you know back when we were all playing with like a lot of people around like he was definitely top on my list of someone I hated playing against just because like he was always a pain in the ass to shoot against like when I was running an AR but like still yeah I think he had a lot of like a lot more in him but I, I, I hope that he is like way less stressed living a lot like more of a like just like a more comfortable like happy life you know he's got a lot of yeah. things going on and like 
if that's what he wants to do, then good for him. I already know he's going to succeed in content. We like I think everyone knows that. Like he's he's a really funny kid. He's really good at it. He's really consistent, and I think that's the easy part for him. So yeah, I don't know. I wish him the best. I, I'm, I'm excited to see like where he goes with the content world. To be honest. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Sam, listen, Sam could have probably still have kept playing and played at a high level, but you know, if if his hundred percent is not there, he seems like one of the guys. It's like I don't think you were a similar person, Chris. You're just like, yeah, if I'm not if I'm not in it. Holy, like, there's no point. I'm just can't cost to my team. Exactly. Yeah. You, you can't be. If he's actually one foot out the door type thing, like, it's just hard because, yeah, it, you know, you feel like you're, like, just not putting the effort in that everybody else around you is, you know? And especially, like, on that LA Thieves team, you know, you got, like, Draza playing, like, freaking 60 hours of COD straight. You know, it's like, you don't, <clears throat> you want to be able to match the energy of the players around you. And if you feel like you can't, <clears throat> I feel like some, stuff like that, like, can obviously affect you too. So it's like, yeah, yeah I, I get why he did. He definitely should have if he felt like that. And he did everything he wanted to. I think that world championship was a big reason that he feels comfortable to now do it. Like once you win that one time, at least, you you know, that's the one you go for, bro. Yeah, that's, like, everything, yeah. yeah, that's everything. Like that, like that moment in your COD career, I feel like changes so much for you. Because you're like, I feel like that's why everyone starts competing is that. So I think when that happened... I think that made him more comfortable doing something like this and like a lot, just again, be able to retire on like happier terms. So again, he's a, he's a beast dude. He was one of my least favorite people to compete against in the sense of his skill, but he's awesome. So I'm excited for him. Cool. Well, let's uh, move on. Uh, I'm actually going to deviate a little bit from the outline here. Uh, Cause I noticed there was a team missing. I want to talk about Toronto. I don't even know where to begin with this one. Cause it's been, this has been the team that's been talked a lot about in rumors on social media, on Reddit, and it's a lot of different conflicting information. So who knows what's really going on there? Um, Chris, like from the outside looking in, like, like I'm curious your thoughts on that situation because it's just it's confusing what their actual plan is. Wow. Like, what would you what would you do if you were them? Like coming off of this year where you played well with Charlie, you picked him up, you won an event, you made it to the finals of champs, and you got smoked. Like, what would you do in this off season? Why'd you gotta edit the guy smoked like that, bro? What's wrong with you? But um, no, I'm just giving context. That's how it goes, my guy. Like, Jesus. yeah, you get five votes. Like, oh my god, bro. Like, 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 it is what it is. Okay. I know, it's, I know, it's Scrap's birthday. Happy birthday, Scrap. But like, bro, like, it happens, you know. Nice. Um. Okay. Um. Anyway. Um. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I listen. I just got back on the Twitter app and everything, and I feel like everything I see, like. Half of it's that, like, it was a money thing. The other half of it, that that's actually not true at all. And a bunch of other things. So, like, I don't really know what their strategy is. You know what I mean? So, it's like, I, I, feel, I feel like a big thing with strategy and all that stuff is just, like, money in general. Like, I, I, at the end of the day, like, that is a very, I feel like, overlooked in the CDL. But, like, very important factor to, like, the way people make and build their teams and the strategy behind that and be able to make money having a team you know what i mean like that is very yeah. important to try and become like somewhat profitable i know it's not realistic right at the moment but like you know that is what people are striving to do like you can't just keep doing that so it's like it really depends on what they want to do in that case like i don't know how much they're paying those guys and all that stuff like what what it looks like what their budget is but like that seemed on twitter to be the biggest thing for them so it's like clearly their team was obviously good you know what i mean they made it to the champs finals and lost and you know be respectful they were they were good all and, even with eli they were good all season no they that's had, what like, i mean they had a good season event, yeah yeah they had a good season that's my point so it's like it's not about like being good or bad it's i feel like that's also a strategy with them with them and everything like that because i heard they were selling kleenex and whatever you know say like i i've heard like so many different things with them on like just yeah you know social media and stuff i don't know what is fully true and what not to as I'll say, there's been a couple things that have been released that, like, not about them, but other things that have been released that I actually know were not true. And, like, so it's like, I don't know what the fuck I believe anymore. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't I, really uh... know what their scenario is. But I do think, because, like, I do think money is just important. Like, if they're trying to spend and stuff, then, like, I feel like they can do that. If they're not, I don't know. So they're, like, a question mark for me, to be honest. I have no idea. Let me, let me take this one. I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but I have a lot to say. 
on Toronto. Go I, I've it. talked to a lot of people in and around the situation. Um, you know, they've got a pretty big camp. Um, this is obviously like, you know, people in the still in the organization, the players, like people in the players camp and like obviously people that they they laid off a lot of people this year and they obviously have strong opinions about the organization. I think like you know, they got uh, after Mono for 2019, um, they had a pretty clear plan on what they wanted to do, and it went pretty well. Cold War year was a great year for Toronto. Obviously, they kept short in the grand finals against you guys. Um, and then Vanguard, the year didn't really go as expected, but they still kept the project together, especially around you know Toby and Jamie. They had this scrappy kid who was absolutely frying in challengers last year, and they were like, okay, well, like, you know, we need to bring him in, and, and he may be our new superstar, right? Because Cammy, we thought was, and then Ben, we thought were, and they obviously were amazing in Cold War, but things just didn't click. They weren't that bad in Vanguard, but every time they had a clutch situation, just never came through, and they just came up short. Um, and then I think the two things happen. One is like I think there's some sentiment within the org that like the team as a whole is good, but it's kind of run its course in terms of their ability to win. And second is obviously the market conditions that exist in esports. I believe that overactive media the parent company of toronto ultra is a public company i don't think that they're like a private company so they have a sort of issue where as far as some of these decisions go people within the organization have to consider uh, they have what's called a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders right they need to guarantee that they make decisions where the people that own shares in the company can make money that the, the company is profitable so i think some of this stuff is conflicting because yeah, you can keep players like Kleenex and Insight, but they've been there since year one and you're giving them continual raises. Suddenly like the, the salary structure of the team doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I just think Toronto's kind of in an issue where they're trying to decide what they want to do going forward. I think where things kind of got sideways in the last week and that's why a lot of stuff kind of got leaked is I just think that you know, we talked about it earlier in this podcast, Chris. Your team has a very like collaborative conversation around roster changes, right? If you're going to make a change, people sit down and talk about it and they figure it out. I don't think that's the process that went on as far as I can tell with Toronto. And that's a lot of frustration and why stuff has come out because decisions were being made or considered and people weren't being talked about those decisions or things were decided and no one was consulted on. And I think that's a difficult thing what's going on with Toronto and why things are a little unstable. Yeah, I mean, so. you you seem to know more about the scenario than me and MC. Me and MC. Yeah, no, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm on Twitter, so I don't even know what's going on with Toronto. Listen, yeah, there, there's just there's just a lot of people in that in that camp that just want to speak. They don't want to speak out publicly, but like they'll they'll talk to people behind the scenes about it. And like I ask them, like, cool, if I can say on stream or whatever anonymously, and they're down. Um, I I've been trying to get people from Toronto to come on shows like this, and I'm gonna still try because I would love them to kind of give their explanation for their decisions they're making and maybe they'll do it like you know after all I'll this is done after. and kind of explain a post yeah. yeah but it seems like there's going to be changes in toronto I, I just very unclear at the moment what they're going to do and the problem is like if they're a player in the market you know they have a player sitting on their bench that's you know rookie of the year and if he's going to leave this is like you know damian lillard there was news today that lillard's requested a trade like you know the scrap situation that obviously shifts the market so We'll mm -hmm. see. There's a lot of instability there. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, not much else to really say on Toronto because that one's just a clusterfuck. Let's talk about <laughs> a situation. We keep talking about this team taking a step up. We did last year with Boston. We're like, bro, they had a good starting year, leftovers team. They were grinding top sixes, top fours. Let's have this team take a step up. They took a step backwards this year. I don't think at any point I sat down and I was like, yeah, Boston's beating Bays or Toronto or New York or Seattle at one point, like this team's best top six. And they made a couple of roster changes to the point where they brought in a rookie for champs. I don't think I've ever seen uh, like a pro team do that, right? They just threw someone yeah. in the wolves in between. Which still should not have Boston. been allowed. It should not have been that allowed. You and I, you and I had a very long conversation on this podcast about it. Where we were both like, nah, that's actually Absolute ridiculous. Horseshit. They were able to do that and they should yeah. change their role for next year. Yes. Listen, ask MC, bro. MC's quiet over there right now. You went on a whole rant about Toronto and I think you checked MC. I check, well, MT's also on hour like 19 <laughs> of a 24 hour stream, so he might be checked to begin with. So, so you asked me about Boston. Wait, yeah, M M yeah. MC, Boston's got a million people on the roster. They released Big Wake, Vivid, and Nero. They could bring those players back. The only players on the roster right now are Beans and Crump. I assume 
Snoopy is coming back, but that might not be a thing. What do you do if you're Boston right now? Like, like what, like what path are we going I'm, down here? If I'm Boston, I'll probably keep Snoopy. I, I could, cause I feel like Snoopy played really good for like his first event being champs and stuff, and I feel like he, like, like the, like the talent's there, you know. Like, mm. obviously, you can see Snoopy, and you see he's like he's talented and shit. So, I'll keep yeah. Snoopy. And 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 you said they released Awakening or Beans. Uh, Beans, they kept in Big Wake, they released. They could directly re-sign Wake, but they let his... We gotta be careful. This is a key thing with this roster mania. You might see players that didn't get their team option picked up that will get potentially re-signed, but the org will sign them at a different or a lower salary rate. This is sort of a play that I expect the teams are doing to sort of leverage some players down. So I wouldn't say that Big Wake is 100% not coming back, but at the moment, he's not on the roster. I would say, I feel like Wake has more potential than Beans. I would say keep Wake, Snoopy, bring Doug on. Oh, we're bringing Doug on. We're bringing Doug on. Bring okay. Doug on. MC bring wants Doug, Doug. on. We're calling, we're calling Doug up. And now we Start need a the flex. Air. We need a flex. So we, who we got as a flex? So you're having, you're having Wake be like a full-time AR, is what you're saying? Yeah, I have him be an AR, yeah. I feel like Wake well, plays more like an AR. Than yeah. a flex, personally. Can we talk about? Can we talk about Wake? What are you, yeah. Chris, going with you? What What do you think about Wake? Do you think like he's got a problem not playing for the win? Do you think there's a lot of like <laughs> certain developmental things that he just hasn't progressed on the last couple of years? Kind of like hindered uh, where he's at as a player. I don't know. I mean, I've never spoken a word to him. I don't think like I. He's very quiet. Never. Hundred like, percent. Like, never I, said anything. I, I, I really don't. I think like back in Black Ops Three, <laughs> search wise, I think I. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm talking about like now, yeah. like. I haven't ever really spoken to him on like what how he views Call of Duty, what he thinks. You know what I'm saying? I've never had like conversations like that with him. So like I don't know much about him as a player. Like even like, you know, I don't really do like the whole gossip thing either. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't really hear about him. Like I don't ask like I like I kind of stay out of it. I yeah. personally think though, like I think he's really talented. I think he's good. I think he plays more more of like a mainish kind of AR. You know what I mean? Like I think he's like a little bit slower from like what it seems. I feel like when we play him in scrims, he's a little bit more aggressive than he is in matches. You know what I mean? Like at least that's how it comes off. But like, yeah, I wouldn't say he doesn't play for the win. Like I, I feel like the to make a statement like that, you gotta know the person. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta like know the person pretty well to like make a statement like that. Like maybe his style is like you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It depends on, like, what his coaches are telling him to do. It's all about the win conditions of teams and stuff, like how they're, like, trying to program their team. But, like, yeah, I think Wake has a shit ton of potential. What MC said, I agree with. I think he has a lot of potential to be really good. I still think he is really good for this Boston team. I just think, like, honestly, I would love to see someone like Ghosty or someone around him in the sense of just, yeah. like, someone that could either get more hill time and help him out that way or vice versa, like, just be able to push out and like make him get more hill time. You know, say like just like fix it up some way or some like somehow. I, I don't know their style of like what they're going for, like as a staff and all that, but like I do think Wake is very talented. I think he has the gun skill to hang with the best players in the league. You know what I mean? I think he is very good. So it's like I wouldn't want to fully get rid of him personally. But I also don't know anything about his attitude and everything else behind the scenes with that. So like I don't know. But like this Boston team's weird because I, I do think like when they lost Zinni. I feel like they lost, like, a, this has kind of been, like, their narrative from the outside looking in. Is like, I, I do think having someone, it's not always about being around and being old and, like, having yeah. a veteran. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, like, that's not, like, what I mean by, like, the veteran experience, which is, like, because Ghosty is not, you know what I mean? Like, Ghosty is not freaking. That's, like, 21. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, a, he was basically the IGL for Optic. I think we'd all agree. He was a pretty important part of their comms and IGLing and like so it's not about just like that as much as it's just like having someone with like more like sense of direction because I just feel like this Boston team from the outside looking in just looks like a team with a bunch of people that have a very high ceiling some of them with a lower floor like a little inconsistency here and there but like they're just kind of all over the place and I do feel like their comms have always been like weird since they lost like Zinn and like I do think like having someone like that can actually help them out a lot because I don't think they're missing the talent necessarily as as much yeah. as uh, as much as they're missing either the execution or just a better plan. One of the two. You know what I mean? And I feel like in uh, order to execute that plan, having people that can lead and provide the energy and all that stuff is like really really important. So 
I, I yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm a big fan of Wake's gameplay in the sense of just his talent, and I think like getting the best out of him would be still willing to take the risk, depending. But again, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes with those guys. And Snoopy's think, still a big question mark, by the way, too, because we have yeah. no idea what no, Snoopy's, yeah. what's, what Snoopy's bringing to the table. He played well. He looked good. In but two series. That's what camps. I mean. But like, that's what I mean. Who knows? Like, yeah. I don't really know how their scrims are going. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Here, here's what I think. We were talking about this team literally earlier in the show. We are talking about Cold War LA Thieves. I think Boston this season was very similar. Like, it clearly was a situation where there was inconsistencies from practice to matches. The coaching staff was clearly trying to find something because they clearly felt like the team couldn't win and they just tried a lot and it all just didn't work. Mm -hmm. They had a huge problem once, I agree with you, once Zin left, like I think they lost that experience. And I don't think they necessarily need that experience to come from someone like, say, a Clay, who's just been around for forever. They need someone that's like a calming presence in game, at a game, it can help them get better and translate their practice to matches better. Because I think you agree, Chris. Uh, everyone I ever talked to is like, Boston's good in scrims. But then you play them in a match, and it's like, see, it's just not translating. Do you agree with that but, or no? But to cut you off, I actually agree to that to a point. They weren't terrible okay. in scrims. Take this with a grain of salt. But I feel like they were way, I feel like they were way better in scrims. MC, I don't know if you agree with this. I feel like when we used to play Boston, like from what I used to watch, they were a pain in the ass to play against when they had Zinn. I feel like when they had more of like, it seemed like more organization, like a little bit more of like a method to their madness of like, yeah. no Nero and David running around like fucking, well, last, yeah, true, that's, that's crazy. But uh, like just crazy, like, like those two were going crazy and they had more organization. It looked like they had more of a plan. I feel like when he retired, I don't think they were as much of an issue scrims wise more like, yeah more like I, random like more randomness but like yeah there, there there used to be a time where we would scrim boston and i would be like all right this is a good fucking scrim in the sense like this is going to be a team where like they beat they take yeah. a lot of maps off us i'm tired of watching my fucking team lose to these guys shut the fuck up and start the, let's, let's start playing you know what i mean but then like towards the end of the year i didn't feel like that at all and i and i'm not saying like I'm not even trying to take a shot. It's more or less just like, I, I feel like when they lost the organization and then like Nero and Vivid, like, you know, I feel like they were, I feel like they were in a better spot that way. Like, I don't know. It just seemed like they were not as dominant as they were in scrims, at least versus us. And then not translating the matches anymore. I feel like that kind of faded as well. And that's like the scary thing is like, if you're doing it in practice, you know, it's there. I don't feel like they were doing it in practice as much as I used to feel it when they had the other team. And I don't know if that's like a Nero and Vivid thing. I don't know if that was just like a culture thing and then they obviously like they exploded. I'm not sure with that. Just they kind of dropped Vivid and then picked him up and then dropped him, you know what I mean? Or was it just like the organization of having someone like Zinni who does preach like we need to play this way, that way, and the and the other. So like I don't know. I just think uh when I talk to people around the Boston camp mm -hmm. and keep in mind some of the I just wanna add this context because again, I want to make sure that people know where it first come from. Like some of this has come from people or camps of people that like aren't on a team hmm. anymore. So you can kind of read between the lines there. Okay. They definitely had a culture change once Zen left. But they all kind of understood to an extent that like they had a huge like experience gap to like your team, Thieves, Faze, Thieves, like Optic, even like a Seattle. Like these have been experienced things. And like the coaching staff had been around for a long time. Like those players have played forever, but they're just never able to bridge that. And they were never able to like overcome that experience with executing their system at like a super high level. Right. Yeah. You don't need a million years of experience. If you just play your game and you're hitting your ceiling, like you can probably beat a lot of those teams with more experience, you know, mm. but they never got there. And then they were just kind of taking, throwing darts at a dartboard, hoping that like the honeymoon with this team would work. And I think this can be clear going in the season they're going to try and find someone who's a player to be the center of their culture whether to your point that's dan ghosty who i think can do it or someone like clay i think that's like the big thing they're missing. Not a bad lost option either. Slasher is also a bad option. 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 Yeah. Yeah. option i would say slasher is also someone that like brings very good culture around practice and stuff and that's what i mean i feel like they're missing that and i could be completely wrong they could be watching this podcast right now and be like holy shit these guys have no idea what they're talking about because like but, like, I, I truly think, like, that culture aspect, it just seems so weird. Like, I feel like every time we'd play them, like, the minimap would just look different, confusing. Like, I definitely think the scrims thing faded with them, and I, I don't know. And, like, even Troy's in here said, like, they were definitely really solid with Zinn. 
You also have to remember too, didn't Wake get sick, Major One? That was Major One, Troy. What didn't yeah. Wake get sick? That's what I mean. Like that could have been much different too if that didn't happen. Like they played good at Han. They played good at Boston. I mean, they, they, did. they, they lost did. that event because they fucking troll bad against Optic and losers bracket. That was probably the worst series I saw Boston play all year because yeah. they could have won. They could have three o that series. Yeah. Honest to God, no bullshit. Against Optic, they they trolled all three maps in spectacular fashion. And that, like, I, they almost like killed their team because then retired after that, and they were never able to replace that like presence on the team. Yeah, and that's and that's what I mean. So it's like I I think that's like something they should really go for because, uh, I I I truly think the culture of a team is just so important, and I think that's the only way you get better. And I I do think like yeah, Clay Slasher Dan Ghosty, like someone that's gonna instill something more where like you're just getting better practice or a better idea. Like I don't know if Ghosty is a good practice player in the sense like. He brings like what Austin does. I think it's a little bit different, but I do think Ghosty IGLing wise is communication and stuff is really good. So it's like that would still even help. But I I, I don't know his outside culture too much yet. But I'm gonna throw yeah. another name. What that we haven't talked about? He could put in my chat, and I think it would be interesting for this team is Illy. Don't obviously know what's going on with him and hand and all this other stuff. Was, but if he's playing, his question mark is that right? The hand. Yeah. Yeah. If, but if if we get a major one Vanguard Ender. I mean, that's that's the thing this team needs. Ender is that when he's engaged, he's that guy, bro. But that's he's what it there. Means. Yeah, they need something like that. That's a, yeah. that's a fair point, too. That he's just, uh, yeah, that just scares me with his hand because I don't know. I never even, I feel like I never even found out like what actually happened with that. No, I don't think anyone knows. I've been trying to yeah. hit up Ender and be like, yo, come on the flank. Like, like, let's clear the air on this stuff. So, like, this will help you being on a team because mm -hmm. this shit's just out there. But, like, yeah, that's just, you know, Illy, Ender is good. Is he a elite slayer? He's, never been an elite slayer in his career when he's won events those events he's fried right like when they played you guys at major four cold war that was probably the best event that empire had in that year like he fried that at that event and obviously you guys kind of took control that series in the middle and kind of closed it out he played really good at major one against you guys uh in vanguard like mm. i think he was super important in that finals against you guys yeah um yeah, on gava too but obviously since then he's you know been in and out of the lineup and whatever and like you know, if he if he can contribute out of game and be that guy to make them an S and D first team, like keep them organized, like he could be a low key like great add to Boston. So I'm 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 curious what they do. I actually think they're a really good destination this roster mania because they have some interesting pieces. They have a either what I think is a pretty solid coaching staff. I I've yeah, talked to definitely. Dens and Zed a lot. I feel like, or at least from my perspective, they have a good head on their shoulders. They just have certain things that they gotta you know work around with their team. It is what it is, and like I, I think. If I'm a player, that's a potential really good option to get on a team that's going to be competitive, very competitive next year. So, yeah. but let's t let's move and talk about um, a couple of situations that are seem like at the moment, as far as we've seen from rumors, are maybe complete start over situations. Mm -hmm. We got Minnesota and the Seattle Surge. I'm gonna start with you, Chris. Considering the organizations who they have kept from their coaching staff. Which of the two do you think is going to be like a better spot for people that are sort of left over and kind of going to have to choose between those two situations? Who's left over right now in Minnesota and Seattle? Is anyone? Right now, I don't think both teams are basically squad wiped. Seattle, I don't think Sam Phoenix is coming back. Mm -hmm. Wait, is Brock is obviously announced? announced what? Like that they're squad wiping or no? Um, I don't think they or renewed chat. Really? I'm pretty sure they didn't renew the option on anyone. Correct chat? I'm pretty sure everybody. Everybody's a free agent. So, they, so basically, well, they, both teams are squad Dante, wiping. Dante and Dante and um, they had a bunch of people. I don't know if all four of them or a bunch of them were unrestricted free agents anyway. Um, but other people just didn't get their option picked up. Okay. And so, then Rocker didn't pick up the option on their players, so they're they're clean. So yeah, hypothetically, most likely we're just, we're talking as if both of these teams squad wiped. Most likely. Yeah, that's it's, the best yeah. way. I think the best way to frame it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh who has the better spot for a full rebuild? Fuck, whoever has the most money. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know I mean? like seriously, like, like, I mean, at that point, like, it's a free for all of who you can get. You know what I mean? Like, whoever, whoever wants to spend more money and get better players is probably, is probably going to win it. Like, in that sense, like, I don't know, like, what each, each team's plan is. You know what I mean? But listen, we haven't talked about him a lot, but Sib is an incredible. And yeah. a very underrated option right now in the offseason as well. 100%. Yeah, and we're not 100%. talking about him too, where it's like, 
you know, yeah, Sib's not the sub that you're trying to build around like we talked about, but he is disgusting. Don't get it twisted. He is very, very good. And I will say one thing. I've talked to people around him about him, just his attitude and all that stuff too. And he's got like, a, he, you know, he's got a, he's been a very good teammate. He's, you know, his head's on straight. Like he's been like trying to get better and better and stuff. Like he's also really good as well. So it's like Seattle can try and keep him potentially, you know, and then like get people around him depending on that. But like, I think they have a completely even chance of, who is the better spot? It really just comes down to who wants to spend the more money right now. Like, yeah. And, and just, and it also depends on the dominoes that fall with some of the other organizations that we were talking about before, like phase Steve's optic, all that. Like, I feel like yeah. that's kind of where it goes. And then it's going to be a super competitive hunt from there. I think those teams too, if they wanted to spend money, should be trying to like sneak in like an envoy and like try and build like a crazy team too, if they could, you know what I mean? Like if they could, obviously I don't think that's going to be very easy either, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think we have to kind of just, I mean, that's a real, that's, I guess, an impossible spot. I would say one thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wouldn't want to live in Minnesota personally. I know they weren't, I know they were in Texas, I think, this year. So that, they were going to do like the Texas and they moved to Minnesota in the spring and they canceled that. They, I, think I was going to say that. Yeah, Texas that's a now. pain in the ass to do that. A, a, a move midseason yeah. also kind of sucks. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So. Yeah. If there's none of that involved, then I think it's a completely fair game. Whoever wants to go ahead and lock up the right people. And also, it's weird, though, too, because coaching staffs wise, too, they've wiped. So now what the hell do you do? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what do you do in that sense? Like, yeah, what, are you investing what? in coaching as well and then building a team? You know what I mean? Like, well, Seattle. So Seattle's interesting. I think Revan's still there. He's a GM, but he's not a coach. Um... Car, I think they're analysts. I don't know if Carson's still there. Car, they picked up Carson this year. Carson's um, great. So they've yeah. got analysts. Carson's great. We had him. On, I had worked with him mm -hmm. on the EE broadcast, CDL broadcast before I left esports, and he was he was the best ad one we had. But on the Rockers side, like I don't know if Dan's still there. Looney, I I don't think they say anything about Dan. Obviously, Brian's moved on. So yeah, I mean that's definitely the coach could be a big kind of wild card in both. This Wait, is, is like a recruiting. Is, is the subs gone too? Like uh, their subs? Yeah, Gwen Gwen got. Gwen, they're not bringing back, and they did not pick up the option on anyone on Rocker. I think they let everybody walk. I'm double checking hey, right now. Too. Yeah, I think Rocker Rocker is so apparently 100% clean Rocker. right now. Yeah, so it's like okay, Ludi, so their new head coach. Like you know what I mean? Like, what are they doing with that? Because I'll say one thing: like, I don't think coaches make or break teams. I'll even say that being a coach myself, you know what I mean? But yeah, like, degassing yourself, that stuff. But but I will say I also do think establishing the right culture and stuff and everything else is also really important. And I also do think that comes from the top down. And I think that like again doesn't make or break a team, but I also think it's incredibly important. You know what I mean? Like we're not executing. Like I'm not going on stage and getting a three piece for MC. Like you know I don't do the work that MC does. But like I think showing up every day, getting everything on the table, making sure everyone's being transparent, making sure you're showing up and getting better, et cetera, et cetera. I can go down a list of a billion things like it's really important to get that done too. And also like, I guess like scouting talent and stuff too. You want to try and have people that like know call of duty really well. I would say like Danny Looney is a good person with rocker that probably knows what he's talking about. Like is important there. And then you also have people too, like Tommy from Warzone, which used to be a CWL pro, like a very good one. He was tweeting about it. I talked to him, like he wants to coach. Like there's a lot of people that are interested in that too, where it's like, maybe you go for that first and then like have them build a roster because as respectfully as possible, you're probably going to have, like, you know, those guys will probably going to understand how to build a roster better than just a random management person most of the time. Not always. There's some people that are very knowledgeable. But, like, yeah. I think all that stuff is, like, uh, important. So I, I think, like, that might be a route that, like, some of them want to go down. If they have Looney, though, then I think they're good. But, like, Seattle would be something else since, I guess, I don't know why they didn't go with Sam again, but, yeah. Maybe something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm curious, and I wanted to back up on the Dante thing. Like, I, I've talked to Dante quite a bit, and you got to remember with him, he's still like, this is still a second pro season. Like, he was obviously on your academy team for a bit, but he his first pro season was Vanguard with this team. Um, and, and when I talked to Dante, like, he just tried to learn a lot the last two years, and so I think whatever team he goes to next, I think he's going to be. Not only incredible, I just think he's going to be like he's learned a lot about being a teammate and like 
I think the problem is in challengers, like you kind of, there's an expectation or the way that people tell you to get standout challengers, you got to be like that guy and then kind of sacrifice some good teammate stuff to be that guy. But then you get to the pro side and like, that's not the best way to win. Um, so, you know, I agree with you. I think people are kind of, I haven't seen a lot of chatter on Sib and I feel like he may be one of the best pickups this off season. People yeah, he could be. really aren't talking about a lot. So I like that. So yeah, we'll see. I think, Minnesota Seattle roster rumors will be a little bit later because of the complex nature of their situations. So I caution everybody, they may be slow for us to get um info on caution. even next week. Yeah. Just, I like that. Just, like, don't if people, if people if people come my chat on like Wednesday and be like, where are Minnesota news? I'm like, they might still be talking to people at Shell. Yeah. All right, we got four more teams to talk about. We're gonna talk about one, then we're gonna talk about three together. Because I think the three together kind of tie. First thing we're gonna talk about. Florida. The expectation for Florida is that they're rebranding to the Miami Heretics, and they're going with a full Spanish team. So I want to start with you, Chris. You obviously grind. I'll give a it to MC first. Bro. Give it to MC. I'm giving it to MC first. All right. Give MC the mic. MC, are you excited to potentially square up against a full Spanish squad <laughs> next season? Yes, I'm hyped. That's me lit. <laughs> excited. You excited but, for Vickle and then fucking hit Suey's on you across the stage? Like, <laughs> so, wait, is, is their whole team Florida? Like, they all got squad wiped? Uh, so the way yeah, that yeah. Roster Mania went down so far for Florida, the only person that is still on the lineup is Vickle. Everybody else got released or didn't get their option picked up. Um, so, so Vickle's in one left. The rumor is right now, Chad, this isn't confirmed. This is a rumor is that uh, the team is going to be Vickle. Juan, aka Journey, who is on your guys' uh, academy team, obviously in the beginning of CDL. Medals, Eric Boom, and Lucky. As that is the rumor from earlier this uh, ring. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I, I don't see how, I don't know how they're gonna like do because I I never seen like some of them play. Like I I've seen Journey play, but that was like so long ago. So the other two I haven't seen them play in like forever too. So I, I honestly don't know how they're gonna play. But I mean, I mean, I'm hoping I'm hoping they come out strong, you know, so that it's a new org. And they're, they're a new Spanish team, too, so it's going to be cool if they do good. Chris, yeah. I know, obviously, you played a lot of ranked play with Vickle the last few months, and then uh, I think you got to know Juan pretty good when he was mm -hmm. on your org. Yeah. So, like, what are your thoughts on the Miami Heretics rumored situation going next year? The first thing I saw is, respectfully, they're going to be ass. And I don't know how long you've been watching Call of Duty for, but, like, they could be. There is a world where they could just not be good anymore. Like, uh, you never know, but, like, I've said this before. I think we talked about this on one of the episodes, Ben. Like, the Heretic team in Black Ops 4 was a top six team. And, and, and yeah, people I, don't talk about and, it. They and, were and good. First they were of really all, good. And first of all, that's when they had Methods playing pretty poorly, too. Like, he wasn't playing very well, right? I'm not mistaken about that. Sick. Yes. Like, yeah, Methods no, sick. But he yeah. was playing, like, off roll. Like, they, they had a funky... It was a they had a funky system, but my point is, is, like, they yeah. didn't have a star-studded lineup of those players. Like, if, if you replaced him and had someone else that was slaying heavier, they could have been a really scary team. Like, it, I'm sure he brought a lot to the team, too. Like, uh, you know, I'm not disrespecting him. Mean, he was a good cop player throughout his years. Like, his years, like, he was good. But, like, I think, like, with how Call of Duty's become now, like, you, you really need to keep up with the slaying, right? Like, I, we've talked about that. And so, yeah, I don't know, like, if that person had said in my chat, or I'm not sure, just, like, hasn't watched COD, but, like, this ain't Black Ops 4. The CDL has far more stacked teams. Black Ops 4 was one of the biggest skill gap games that we've played. And they were a top six team, a top six, top four team is my point. Like that shows you that they had skill is my point. So regardless, like there's a world where like these guys can be really good. I'm not sure exactly the newer players. Like what, what do we, what do you say? Like Eric or what Eric boom? Like, I don't know how good some of the newer guys are. I mean, Eric was playing pretty good in challengers. this yeah, year. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh -huh. Like there's a world where they're, I don't, I don't necessarily think they're going to be like a top three dominant, like squad, but they, could be a lot more serviceable than what florida has been for like the last year and a half you know what i mean and like i think there's a world where they can be better than what people expect i don't really know where they're at i just know that heretics got really screwed over because for the last couple of years of the cdl bro like some of these shit teams have been shit and like the heretics team and the spanish team would have been way better than some of the yeah. rosters that have formed so to, so to say like to say there would just be ass is fucking faded because that's just like they're dude 
I think we're underrating how fucking bad some of the teams that have been formed in the CDL have been. Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent. I mean, we'll get to so someone like London in a bit, but I would hope that I would hope to say as long as like this, like whole like last couple of years, challengers haven't like ruined their mentals and stuff, and just like because that could be a thing too, where it's just been like fucking hell for them. I I think they should be good. It's just that's going to be the biggest question of like, that's the biggest question of just where are we at now with the league like three years from now because it has been a long time since they've been together in the league and like way more committed but at the end of all of this having a full spanish team having the spanish fan base back in the cdl more is going to be awesome i think it only helps the cdl and again it should be better than some of the fucking rosters that we've seen because in like they've some of them have been fucking criminal so yeah i i would say this so um, comparing this to say, because I've seen a lot of people compare it to like Heretics, Black Ops 4, Mind Freak, World War II. I think this is a little bit different. And here's why. Vickle has been here now for a while. Juan has been here before. If Journey's going to be on this team, like he's already had one stint in America. So I think that this isn't like a fresh four people moving to the US for the first time, like got to get mm -hmm. used to all that stuff, living in a new country. It, 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 this team is what it is. Two thirds, two fifths of the team have been here before. They know what to experience. Uh, I think then it's providing that experience down and like what we've seen with the two teams I named of like, and I see Dan in my chat talking about it, taking advantage now of how they practice against these good teams. Yeah. Yes, they may suck off the rip, but if they stay at it and they don't get stuck in like just a chalked mentality, we've seen a couple of the European teams like in past like CWL years, they came here, they were in body of practice every day and then they just gave up. If they stick at it, I think they can be good. I think people are underselling the talent this team because they aren't like big North American challengers names they've seen before. And yeah. I've, I've watched some of these players playing challengers here, like, you know, someone like metals, someone like Eric boom, and they've been very good and they've been some of the best players in Europe in challengers and some of the best players on land in global challengers. Cause these are got players that have either won events this year or they've made it to the grand finals. Like they are good. I don't know how this team will play. This rumor team will play together. Cause it's a little bit of a mixed squad, but uh, I think that they could surprise people. I think uh, like another example is people were shit talking the team that London built going into the, and I'm one of these people was not super high on the London team going into Vanguard teams can surprise you that London team in Vanguard. Yes. They didn't win anything, but they were like solidly sometimes top four, top six. I could see that happening for Miami heretics. So I think they'll be top three. I don't really think so. Not maybe not this year, but to the people in my chat saying, oh, they're easily like top eight. You might want to check yourself for a second before you start making that claim because I think they can play a lot better than that. I agree. I think their ceiling is higher than what people are giving them. But I, I totally understand this, like the, you know, the, 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 the doubters of it too. Like the doubt of it. Like I understand the doubt of it, but I feel like if Heretics didn't get completely and utterly screwed over by the CDL and the franchise model, I think that the Spanish team, like they were on the up and up. Like that was like when they started trying to like get better practice and stuff. And I feel like they were slowly getting better and better and better. What did they get at Black Ops 4 Champs? I know this is a while ago now, but uh, was it top it six, top four, top six? I want to so, say. If, if we talk about Black Ops 4, they Ish. got um, they got eighth at Fort Worth. They got sixth at London, eighth at Anaheim, uh, tenth at playoffs. And they actually got top 16 at, at World Champs at Champs. They actually... I bombed out of that oh, so they maybe a group. Then they had the had a bad group. So maybe again, like they didn't have it. But I just remember, like from what I was watching them play, like every time you played Heretics, like they always played close matches with some of the big teams, even our team. Like they had good gun skill. And again, I truly think they were lacking slaying power when they had methods. So it's like I I think like that team was better than they could have been. There is a very big doubt of like what they can do, and I'll, I'll see. But I know they were on the up and up, but. I don't know, we'll see. I, I think some of these newer challengers and stuff too will be better. But regardless, I will say that they will be better than some of the fucking rosters that have been formed in the last four years of the CDL being one of the... 100%. It's been, again, those teams have been worse. So we'll see. I, I understand the doubt. I do think they'll be a little bit better than what people think. I don't think they're going to be top three unless like, unless like some of these new guys are actually the truth. But we'll kind of have to wait and see from that. I don't know. Yeah, listen, Vickle's my boy. Uh, excited to see what they put together there again. This is rumored. Obviously, they can maybe decide. Maybe this merger doesn't happen and they go yeah. a different direction. But I also think it would be good for the CDL. I think getting a Spanish language team uh, brings another level of support from Spanish speaking countries. 
Uh, the viewership bump when Heretics got in the league in CWL was crazy. It was like another like thirty or 40,000 viewers. I'm not joking. So don't be surprised if the Heretics, the Miami Heretics games get a lot of viewers because they have a pretty big fan base, especially globally, yeah. that organization. Oh, yeah, it's going to help the CDL so. regardless, yeah. Wait, is is uh, Brezzy not rooming on that, on that team, though? Bre Brezzy? No. Well, Brezzy speaks French. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's a different, different language. <laughs> I like Brezzy like though. I like Brezzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brezzy's I've, nasty. I've, I've, always, I've always seen him from like, damn, like, how do you not like a. Wait. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I whatever. actually agree with MC, bro. When Bre wasn't Brezzy doing good in Black Ops 4 and then when he and entered B the league, I'm, he was yeah, pretty I'm good too. He plays like, I think BM4 he plays like Top Secret Champs, I think, with the E6. Yeah, I think they got in top the Paris bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. He just got, bro. He got like what happened to kids, bro. Like the fucking Paris team. Like the first year Paris team fucking chalked so many careers. Wait, yeah, and Paris, run like, uh, on Paris, was he a starter or, or so? No, he got benched. Remember that in MW 2019, yeah. he was he was on the bench and he that was criminal because they were fucking ass. Wait, so he, he was he was so never, bad. He, wait, so he never played a match? I don't think he did, or he played like one maybe. I don't remember. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember if he in Modern Warfare. I I think or in uh, Modern Warfare 2019, did he play. Challengers, challengers. No, I don't think he actually played. played he something. played challengers the whole year. He was just Damn. sitting on the fucking bench. He was seen with Hydra that year. I yeah, no, dude, that. yeah, I feel like he's always been pretty good, but I, I don't think like, yeah. Oh, the team was so bad. No, that's what I mean. I feel like he could, should have been starting. Yeah, no, because I remember Kismet was on that team too, and they was like it was just Bro, like a shit show. But this is their this is their team. I I completely forgot it. This is the Paris Legion first year team, bro. Lu Luca shocks Dens Kisman and Zed, and they had Timmy Phantoms Brezzy. Wait, Luca shocks Dens Kiz and Zed, and Zed, and they yeah. had Brezzy on their bench. Yeah, and they had Timmy on the bench too. What are we doing? That's what I mean, like bro, like that's what I that's what I'm saying. Like I feel like ah, he got <laughs> fucking smoked for no reason. <laughs> But, but like yeah, I, I've always thought Brezzy was a little bit better than yeah. He yeah. he got to like be able to show out. Yeah, I don't know if he, he was dominant, but he was definitely better than he should have been starting on that fucking roster. That's for goddamn sure. Brezzy like, also just got like bro, like he just got EU challengers are so like annoying and like his problem is like it, it really sucks because like going going into Mar for 2019, he was on E6. Like that E6 team was actually pretty good. At Black Ops Four, and I think they got top they got top four, four. champs. We were just talking about that, yeah. The champs, and then and then mm -hmm. he just got fucking screwed. Like you end up on the one organization that blew everybody to Paris for fucking three weeks, and then just made the team that had the highest KD. Like that was legit. Like what their strategy was. It's like all right, well, yeah, a bunch of people that have no idea career. what they're doing. Yeah, made yeah, a choice. Yes, I, it's just the dumbest shit. So anyway, Brezzy, I would love to see back in the league. I think he's a talented player. Just kind of stuck in the challengers blender, and hopefully he can get out of it. So. Let's talk about three teams that I want to say, chat, or probably you're not going to hear about these squads until maybe after Labor Day. I'm being dead serious. I think these teams are going to take forever to form their teams because they're going to save money and they're not going to sign players now. They're going to wait until the fall. They don't have to pay people for like two or three months. I'm talking about LAG, London, and Vegas Legion. Maybe LAG, maybe less so, but London and Vegas are definitely going to do that. Chris, I'm talking to you like here first. Like, what if you're, what do you do, say, if you're like LAG, right? You're just the last domino to fall. How do you handle, what's the best way to handle this situation? Do you pick up leftovers players, or are you thinking maybe I pick up a challenger squad, drop one player, and that's who we start the season with? Well, if they, they, I'll say, if, since they're not spending as much money as they used to, uh, I mean, I feel like you kind of wait see what you know see what's available and then like i mean I, I don't know who's i don't know who's in charge over there to like scout and make teams but like yeah like, I've, i mean at this point all three of these teams are probably gonna do the same thing like see who's available from the pro world still try and find like you know the best option to build around and then like try and get some challengers and mix them with some of the pro talent that's, you know, in there that like makes the best team. I feel like if you're trying not to spend as big, that's kind of like what you're going to have to go for. And that's really it. I mean, I think LAG's mistake for the last couple of years has just been building horrible rosters, like spending a lot of money and not building the greatest rosters. Their Vanguard roster was weird. Cause like, 
I feel like it could have been better. And then Pierce got sick, and then it got weird. You have said like, and then like they won, but then they like it was like kind of just like a they won, but did they did they lose at the same time? Yeah, they that, fucking... that's what I mean. Like I feel like they were getting better than Pierce got sick. It was weird. So like that Vanguard season for them was just kind of chalked in general. But like I don't think anyone thought they were going to be good this year when they made their roster. And then like I don't know. Like I I feel like yeah, they can definitely do a good job of just like. I don't know if they're keeping anyone from their team or what whatnot, but like trying to build and just trying to find like the right challengers and stuff and just go from there. And it's the same thing for London and Vegas. Like, you know, I think Vegas did a really good job at the end of that too. You know, it's like at the end of the year, like trying to salvage their team. So it's kind of the only, if you're not going to spend big, you have to wait it out, see what's available. And then like really do a deep dive into like, the best challengers that you can get and try and establish a good culture for those challengers to develop and be good players. I feel like that's the best way you can do it. Yeah. Here's what I'll say about Ali G. I think as tough as the season that Alec had, I think there are still players that want to play with Alec. I think people yeah. know that as the best, what he brings. And that's a big thing for Ali G because to your point, they have been they, like, I think London's had some bad off seasons. I think uh, Seattle for two years had some of the worst off seasons. Vegas, but I think LEG, some of the decisions that they have made consistently in roster mania have been like the worst, bro. Like, and I thought last year was egregious. I and I, I don't know if, I don't know if like Alec, Alec was also partially responsible for that. I, I have no idea, but like running back that trio that just bombed out after winning an event and couldn't qualify for champs. And Austin leaves again, Alec, and they're like, yeah, let's run it back again and see if it works. Like, that was ridiculous. And it set them back an entire year because they were just like, well, fuck. Like, Okay, we'll bring in the LG Academy team. Screw over Diamond Con. And like Joe had decent year, exceeded had decent years, but like again, not no disrespect to those guys. They're not elite subs. And uh, you know, it is what it is. Um I am curious how much money LG is gonna spend. Mm -hmm. And you know, they gotta make the right decisions in this situation. Like they have to make sure that they're not, you know. That they, if they're going to do the leftovers or approach and start putting random players together and make sure it works, like they got to put some thought into it, you know. Otherwise, it's going to be the same shit where they're just like major one rolls around. They can can't get a hundred points in a hard point, and it's like, well, we got a one eighty or decision that we spend six months preparing for. So it, it's a I don't know, or I guess they could sell Alec. I guess it's a possibility if someone wants to get Alec and get him off the books. I guess it's possible. Yeah. So I don't know, MC. What do you like? What what do you think? Obviously, you team with Alec for two years, like you know him well. You think like, you think he can like maybe go out there and finesse and like work the DMs and maybe build a good team. Well, it's not it's not really finessing. I feel like Alec has like, like he he's, he's obviously like a decorated player. He's he's won like multiple world championships. So I feel like players would want to play with him, like especially like up and coming challenger players. Like if he doesn't get offers from like other like pro players, but I mean I mean I honestly feel like Alec should be good on the pro team. Like he like he like uh I mean yeah he's shown I feel like so. I don't think I don't think he has anything to worry about. Okay. Well, I don't think there's really much to say about London and Vegas. Like I, I think we'll save that for later episodes. Yeah. I mean um, you just have to wait and see. Like you they're just gonna have to wait it out, whatever happens, and then go from there. Like you can't really predict what the hell that's gonna happen. Yeah, like it's just what Yeah. I'm gonna say it again, Chad, because we've been around here for a while. Like, bro, do not expect Vegas and London to have their roster leaked like tomorrow next week the week after you're not going to hear about their team until maybe august if we're lucky but it may also be like it may also be like the fall yeah. right before the game releases like that's the kind of situation so last time before we maybe take some chat questions there was some news that came out um this week uh, it was a jacob hale article about potentially um some teams exploring unifying their brand names between their call of duty team and their overwatch league team there are a couple of organizations like your organization that kind of checks the box of that like they they have a cdl team and an owl team i'm curious chris starting you your thoughts on on uh, that potential exploration that some franchises are looking at it seems like an activision about you know having their overwatch team and the call of duty team having the same name i don't know i don't think it really matters like i like i think it's cool i guess like i i mean if it helps in any way for teams to either a somehow make more money, it makes more sense or anything of that sort. Like, I think you might as well just do it. I don't really think it's 
that crazy. I don't really put, like, again, like, this is, like, something I just don't put too much thought into just because, like, I don't really deal with it. I mean, yeah, if we were, if we were, you know, Atlanta phase for Overwatch and Atlanta phase for COD, like, that'd be cool. Like, you know, like, I, I feel like it's not, like, that crazy. If it helps in any way, like, we might as well do it. Like, I feel like Overwatch, from what I know, I don't really watch Overwatch. It doesn't seem like they're doing very well. And if it, you know, like, and I feel like if it helps that way, then like maybe, like, I don't, I don't really know. Like, I feel like this is a question that, like, I don't know if MC's on the same page here with me, but I feel like you would know more about some, some shit like this than I would. Like, uh, I, I, I think it's cool, I guess. Like, whatever. That's kind of like, yeah. Not too much to say. What do you think, Ben? Uh, I think there are maybe like one or two brands that might, uh, might do it. Like, for example, your org, I don't yeah. think it makes sense for Atlanta to, make the overwatch team atlanta phase of probably not yeah good. but if it the would help or something push. like i guess but like I, yeah but there are organizations like lag like does a gorilla's mm -hmm. name really do it for the call of duty team or vice versa and would and and listen there's this precedence for this i was telling tom about this example like because it blew his mind it's like bro like you know fc barcelona has a soccer team mm -hmm. they also have a basketball team like there's this exists in the world where like you know you say FC Barcelona could be talked about three different sports teams. So like it exists and yeah. you know, I think the idea is to make it one unified brand that people recognize. So I could see it happening to one or two orgs. I think Seattle surge mm -hmm. in the Vancouver Titans situation. That one is one that could unify. I don't think Boston should do it. I really like the Boston breach branding. Yeah. I think they need to, but maybe they, maybe they bring the breach branding to overwatch league. Maybe some, and I think Jacob Hill was talking about it. Like maybe some of it is more the call of duty branding goes to overwatch league and not the other way around. But, uh, I, I will say this. It's obviously not a big thing, but I do applaud everybody for thinking a little outside the box on how to, I think overwatch league is definitely in a tough spot. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously the player base of the game is not as big as they would have liked. I think the, the league has a, marketable problem where i mean you know you guys for example chris like your organization has probably the best overwatch team but most of the team is korean imports it's hard to there's not a lot of marketable english-speaking north american stars you know makes mm -hmm. it kind of hard um that's sort of things that overwatch league's got to kind of deal with long term whereas quality doesn't have that problem so anything to kind of then keep that seem sustainable is key so i applaud people for thinking outside the box on this yeah if it's, that's what i mean if there's any way to like help i guess like that's what, like it'd be cool but i don't know how many people are going to do it and i also feel like yeah like on certain times like i feel like going from cod to overwatch with branding might help a little bit more than the other way around yeah for the most part I agree. so yeah all right let's take some questions do it yeah let's take some questions i know twitch is kind of busted right now so yeah i was gonna say it seems like Twi twitch is completely messed up first first twitter now twitch is busted what's happening today bro i'm just gonna have to go out and enjoy the world because like, every, chat, every chat chat working? Out. i don't know is your no, chat working? Like, my chat's like messed up right now my chat's working but i think people are, are like having trouble guys listen i'm gonna go back real quick i need to, i need to get pissed bad boy I need all to get right go bed. go get back all good uh, he's on hour 19 right now yeah, MC's yeah, the grinder. We took that. On fucking cloud nine. It's, it's all good. He has his sleep schedule. It doesn't matter now. He's got months to fix that. Talk ASIM. Um, yeah, I'm curious where ASIM goes. We were talking. This this goes back to the conversation we had very much at the beginning of the stream, and I think you probably agree, Chris. You need to you want to build from sub players out because there's only so like premium sub players just hard to get. Yeah, I think a people come my channel like ASIM giving challengers. I think if you look at the way. You probably agree. I think thinking the way kind of things kind of break out, um, you probably agree that um, that Asim probably is going to get on a team just because there's a lot of sub spots and not a lot of players to fill them necessarily. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be in challengers. Uh, I don't think he should be in challengers. I just at the same time, I like, got listen. I don't think he had the best year. I'm not going to sit here and defend that. I think their I think their culture from the rip was fucking chalked. I think everything about that team was chalked. And it sucks. That doesn't give him an excuse. You know what I'm saying? Like, they all, that doesn't give any of them an excuse. You know, like, it, it is what it is. But, like, yeah, I, I still think he's a very, he's a very much, like, more impactful sub than some others. And, like, I still think he plays for the win and still knows how to play Call of Duty better than a lot of people. Like, I wish he had it in him 
to drop a 1.0 and be useless like a lot of people like to do like with a sub like that's the thing people do that and like he can kind of like defend himself more but like i feel like that's just like not in his brain something like the way he plays but i still think like you can form a decent team with him as being one of the subs and like make a good team from challengers like i i do think he's still there i don't think he's going to i don't think he's going to end up like I don't think he's going to end up fucking starting challengers. No, no, yeah. not starting challengers. Like on a great team right now. I don't think he, like, yeah, again, 100%. I also don't think he deserves to just after the league. It's just going to be really tough to kind of argue that. 100%. So it, it's more or less just like, yeah, if you can get a sub with him, that's a little bit more like that can keep his pace, but like also be able to play like the in between that can get more kills and like, you know, be a little bit more like of a ghost to like get some kills, disappear, come back. Like, and like compliment asim i feel like yeah you can find some people right now in the challengers that have good like good ar skills and a skill set and do that but again i think right now the biggest thing with these like bottom teams is i think the biggest thing with the bottom teams is just like the culture of what they're doing like yeah i, I mean honestly like even like with asim like again i don't think this is going to happen but you have like asim and standy together like they're like two totally different styles of subs but like you know what i'm saying like you need to have you i don't think you can pair asim with another asim i think it's a recipe for disaster you need someone that is going to compliment him in a weird way and like yeah i i think with just these teams like what i with what i was going with i just because he just popped up in my chat that's why i said that but like is the culture of all of these teams at the bottom are also a big reason why they suck from my from from how it looks to me oh a hundred percent from how I it looks to, to me people, that's what i mean and so like i don't think that will change unless you do that and that's why i think like it's not saying you know coaching staff's going to do everything for these teams but like trying to build the right culture where like teams don't just chalk it up after a bad major like i just feel like as soon as london had a rough start this year they were down the fucking drain and i'm not blaming their coaching staff i think that, that, that everything as a whole their players to probably didn't help like trying your best to find people to implement that does that is going to be the most important thing for all these teams i think asim and a good culture team can help i think he can try and build that around that and i think all these teams should be shifting for that just in general coaching wise players wise because i think when you have a team like this bro i guess maybe this could be like unfair but you're going into the year knowing that you're going to fucking be fighting for your life to get the champs right 100 percent if that is how you're going to be going into the year, like, I feel like you need to realize, like, you're going to go through a shit ton of times where you're going to be really frustrated. It's going to be a lot harder. It's a lot easier said than done to just be fucking positive all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you're going to have to fight through a lot of fucking shit to make through champs and even sometimes be better and exceed your expectations. So it's like, if you don't have that culture to begin with and, like, really understand that, you're just going to end up with, like, half of these teams these last couple of years just like shit. Like, you have no chance, you suck, and, like, it is what it is. So it's, like, I think that's going to be the most important thing for those guys. And that's what I mean. I, so, yeah, I, I, I think Asim right now won't end up in challengers. I don't think he deserves to be there, but I definitely think he needs to prove himself, hopefully, with a good team this year. I, I agree with you. I mean, bro, like, just... We've talked about this on the show. It's, like, if you're in one of those situations, like, you, you got to recognize that, like, you have a skill gap to the teams up top. The way to bridge that skill gap is building a really good team environment and trust yes. and executing your tactics at a high level mm -hmm. because you might be surprised how good you can play. Yeah. And, like, I feel like multiple teams fucked that up this year. Like, LAG never got to a spot where they were executing their system after they blew up their team. Even they but, them but even with them, I feel like they were the best example. Sorry to cut you off, but, like, yeah, go ahead, bro, like, yeah, they listen. I I don't think anyone thought their first roster was going to be very good, uh, to be honest with you. And then they sucked. And then they made a change. And they blew it up, and they did the academy team. Like they weren't that bad. That academy team wasn't even that bad at major one. And then like they just kept getting they worse. To, they almost made it to the fucking pro bracket. That's what I mean. And like they were just yeah. getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Like they never got better as the year went on. I don't think LAG 100%. trended upward once the entire year. And like. That's my point where it's like, I don't think that team should be going and getting top fours, to be honest with you. But I think like when you, like they seem to have a shitty culture. I'm assuming someone in that camp would probably agree if you asked them. I don't know if that's true, but that's what it seemed like. You can't afford to have that 
and not be an extremely talented team as well. And like, that's what I mean. I feel like you have to like realize what you're getting into. And now granted that's easier said than done when you're going into events, knowing that you can't win. It fucking sucks. I've been there. It's not easy, but like you have to understand like what you're working with and like what you got to fucking kind of like sit down and get ready to do with the people around you. So it's like, I think that's like a really important thing. And once you build that culture, that's kind of how you start building to becoming a good team where like you get some money to spend maybe and you pick up a, the right rookie or the right fucking challenger. And all of a sudden you're top six. And then all of a sudden now you're competing and now this, this rookie wants to stay with you. And then you get another pro on your team. You know what I mean? Like that's how you have to do it. it but it all starts from that. If every year your team just joins the league, goes 0 and five and then chalks the rest of the year, like, you know, it's never going to get better. So it's like, I feel like that's definitely got to be the focus for all those guys right now. I agree. And, and the question for this, like, it was what? The question? Uh, I think people were saying, like, I, I just, in general, like, people were saying, like, oh, well, ASIM be in the league, well, Eli be in the league. Like, I had someone in my chat say, like, we're going to get, like, 12 to 15 rookies this year. I, I don't, I don't oh. think so, because there's, there's just, especially for sub players, like, there's just not a lot of depth. So I think once these teams kind of go through the domino, those players are going to, like, ASIM will end up on a team. But, like, the bigger point that Chris and I are trying to make is, like, and I've argued, you know, me and Parasite have also argued this point a lot on the show. It's, like, the bottom teams don't do the right things to try and, like, get some kind of advantage on people. Like, they don't try and innovate. They don't try and, like, do the extras that you guys are doing, that Optic's doing, that Thieves are doing, where there's, they have more skill and they're also getting ahead. Like, the bottom teams are just chalking it and not getting better. In fact, they're getting worse. And that's why, like, you just get to this top heavy or like situation where there's just a massive fall off after eighth in the league because teams are just fucking. You get to a point where players are just trying to play for their spots next year, not trying to yeah. play to win. Even though playing to win may also then get you a spot next year, like it works cyclically. So that's just kind of the, the situation. Uh, Chris, I think uh, we've gone, kind of gone over two hours. I think we can wrap yeah. it up. Yeah. Well, people, you guys have more questions. questions but, you know. If you have more questions, save it for the next episode because we're gonna try and do these every week. Yeah, um, so I definitely don't... want to do these more consistently. And then when we have a more fun episode too, because this was just like roster changes and stuff, I want to get like MC yeah. and other people on too, again, where we can get I wanna MC get, to talk I want to get RJ on this podcast because I know RJ watches every episode live. That RJ, be... wa RJ watches yeah, every episode of everything. Wait, yeah, has, we will come has he been texting you today? Oh, 100%. He's been texting he, he hasn't me. texted me. Huh. RJ's always around, dude. <laughs> he's been telling you how, Ben. <laughs> yeah, this, well, I'll tell you off stream, but... <laughs> No, nah, but we want to get like Sam on. I want to get we want to get Preston obviously back on. I told Chris I want to do an episode with me, Chris, uh, Joe, and Clint, Mark and Maven. And then I was hanging out with Nameless last night, and I was like, "Bro, we need to do an episode with me, Chris." Yeah, and we also can do comedy. more fun. To, like not like not saying this isn't like fun, but I'm yeah. saying like more like topics that aren't just like CDO organizations wise and stuff. Like we didn't plan on having MC. MC's just kind of here because he's on a fucking 24 hours. Like hour 20 of his 24 but hour stream. What I mean is like, yeah, like the next time we have MC on and stuff too, we can ask about like stuff in his career and like moments and stuff. You have said like more like yeah. behind the scenes stuff. That's not just about current CDL roster media and stuff. We can definitely change up the style depending on who we have on and stuff. But, uh, oh, but yeah. Yeah, chat wants to do one question. I'll give you guys one question. All right. You, you I'm going to run the bathroom real quick. Give me one question, question chat and then I'll, I'll go. I'll pick one. Make it for MC, dude. Make a good question for MC. Make a juicy question for MC, dude. MC wants a good question, dude. But yeah. But other than that, yeah, so that's what we're going to start doing. Um, exclamation point earbud, silly. <sighs> Is the king coming back? Talking about Scump? Scump coming back, dude? Ideal fourth. Are y'all serious right now, bro? Like, you guys are you guys are just a bunch of feds, dude. You're really just you really just sending the question out, thinking that's how that's gonna go. All right, did we get a question? What's MC's thoughts on Nade's comments on him? Did MC answer that already? Uh, I think I did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, t I said I said I don't really care because I asked my team I asked my team about like. Of what they think and they yeah you tweeted that right truth. oh you said that in the no, interview? I, tweeted, I said in the interview after yeah. like a match or something like that i i'll make up an mc question what good clippable mc question oh god mc 
people always go out and say like, oh, MC is the cringiest gamer. He just sneaks all that. You would agree though, in your perspective, that you would love to play a COD where you didn't or wouldn't be able to do all the cheesy stuff. That would be the best version of the game to play, correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I was hoping you were gonna uh, expand on that. Like, expand on saying, that? Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, I wish we had like no snaking, like no, like I'm trying to think, like, like more HP and shit like that. But obviously, the game is just how it is nowadays. And if I wasn't, if like, say, say, if it was G eight, like, if it happened five five, then I would be tight, you know, like, if I died to a snake five five, I'm like, bro, like, the fuck was that, you know? But just how the game is, you know, can't can't really do anything about it. It's just up to the devs to fix it. I mean, I agree. We're, we'll probably talk about more off season, but there's just a lot of stuff that they're doing with the newer Call of Duties that I think uh, bro, have contributed some some less skill gap gameplay, less enjoyable gameplay. Bro, yeah, bro, man, when you ask questions like that, you just be fucking throwing out words sometimes, bro. I, and dude, that's what Chad be saying. That shit is so funny, <laughs> bro. Ben, I'm trying, be, ben trying to like lead MC a little there, bit. Bro. I'm trying to lead MC a little bit to like expand upon it and just give me a well story. i i i i was, I was, thought, I was thought you were about the same word and then I was like, oh, <laughs> he shit. said yeah <laughs> uh, all right i think i'm calling it here you want me to do the outro chris oh uh, yeah you can do it <laughs> all right i appreciate everybody tuning in this is another episode of scrap time uh, obviously if you're watching this live you can check out all the vods on chris's youtube channel was it youtube.com slash um, crowder yt i'm pretty sure crowder yt yeah uh, we're also uh, do have an audio version of the podcast. I think the URL is changing soon, but the easiest URL to use is anchor.fm slash scrap time. You can follow the show on every audio platform that you like. If we're missing any, please let us know and I can get us on those platforms. We're going to try and do these more weekly. So I think the next episode will probably won't be on a Saturday. It'll probably be in the middle of the week, but stay tuned to Twitter uh, for your 600 tweets. You can see a day if you don't have Twitter blue. I'm sure Chris and I will tweet at some point and let you know when the next show is. Appreciate MC for joining us last minute. Thank you, MC. Yep. Uh, and as always, guys, we'll see you on another episode of the show. Peace.